Um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. So this is the open meeting for everyone, including those who are still deciding on becoming Chance Network members, right? <laughs> right. But I, you know, I, I see with like everyone here, it looks like everybody who was in the meeting yesterday is now a Chance Network member, isn't it, Bettina? Yep, so we are very excited. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I think um, my task is to give you an overview of yesterday's um, um, program, just so that we, you, we connect the dots and, 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 and just refresh our mind in terms of what um, the discussions were all about yesterday. And I've prepared uh, PowerPoint slides, if you can just Share them, please, for us to go through. Before, while we were preparing the PowerPoint slides, um, just a reminder that today we have a presentation by Brahma. Brahma Kone is from WHO Afro. Uh, Brahma, where are you? Is he here already? Oh, okay, he'll be coming. But he'll be presenting on the Attach Initiative for Building Resilient and Sustainable Health Systems in Africa at 11.15. So we look forward to that presentation as well. So, yeah, thank you very much. Ah, is that for me? Right. I'm put this here. Oh my God, so many things. Okay. Uh, I think this is okay. Oh, my. Okay. So I've got two mics. Um, I'll try and figure out <laughs> how this works. This is a first. Um, right. Um, so the, thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. Can I turn away from the camera? <laughs> right. Right. So let's get started. So yesterday... We, we, um, we started the session, oh, by the way, just to introduce you to Mr. Brahma Kona, he just walked in, hello. <laughs> Putting you on the spot. So yesterday, we, it was quite an eventful day, you were all there. Um, we started the day with keynote speakers. We had Mr. David Katske from, university, oh, oh, from the University of Botswana, Dr. Matsiri Somueti, um, who's the WHO African Regional Director, um, Her Excellency Petra Pereira, for EU Ambassador, Dr. Vincent Pagiwa, who's the current conference chair, and the Minister of Health from Botswana, Dr. Edwin Dicolotti. So I, I, mean, I won't give you uh, all what they said. We, um, that, that has been captured, but just to give you a snapshot, you know, the speakers talk generally about developing networks, uh, uh, developing work on adaptation in African countries, and the need to develop local, regional, and global networks. Um, Dr. Murthy, just to quote and unquote, she said, we are meeting at, at a defining moment. Climate change threatens to undermine the progress made in the last decade on health, but there are many initiatives, including the attached collaboration to support countries with adaptation in their health systems and tackle common challenges. She also highlighted, which is very important, that top-down approaches are not enough and that the, we need community engagement and bottom-up approaches. Dr. Katske also um, emphasized the importance of supporting the next generation of researchers um, on climate change and health in African universities broadly. We went on to have uh, a session on man managing heat risks, and Dr. Ebenezer, uh, Ebenezer Amankwa from the University of Ghana, Dr. Uh, Kiswen Dida from the Red Cross, Red Crescent, and Ms. Margaret Lugata from the Red Cross Tanzania, say shared some snapshots of ongoing research in their respective areas on heat risks um, in the Sahel, for example, and also in the, the Coastal City Resilience and Extreme Heat Health um, Action Project, the COCHA project. Um, the increasing risks to um, health and health system delivery from extreme, had, uh, from extreme heat and then also lack of interest in heat waves. Uh, these are some of the points that they mentioned. Um, in scientists and in the community is a barrier. We also discussed occupational health matters to address heat. 
We had another very interesting session on climate-sensitive infectious diseases, and Dr. Woyesa highlighted the key findings from, sorry, from our PCC assessment report and the need for action on malaria and diarrhea. Malaria, and basically what he said is that, quote unquote, malaria cannot be separated from social factors, the poverty that, uh, that drives it, and malaria must be controlled also with development activities. Dr. Oyesa also stressed increase for African participation in the IPCC report, um, support for African researchers on climate health, and the need to bring local knowledge into science and adaptation. Professor Moyo described how climate change is, uh, sorry, uh, climate change is increasing the risk of epidemics and give pathogens an advantage, and, and he mentioned how we should be preparing ourselves and the need to interface with people working in environmental health and agriculture. Dr. Natukunda gave a snapshot of adaptation activities in Eastern and Southern Africa and how infectious disease surveillance is a priority in adaptation planning. And basically she said we should treat each challenge um, and create uh, each challenge as a creation of an opportunity. Um, and she talked about the disruption of climate change as an opportunity to get people to work together across the silos. And then um, uh, we had a session on COP26 commitment and climate resilient health systems, and we had a presentation from Ms. Tato Singwakeketse, um, and she discussed in more detail the priorities for achieving climate resilient health systems in Botswana. And then after that, we had group discussions where we identified key priorities, including coloration, capacity building, um, and multi-sectoral work and finance. So collaboration, you know. Then um, we had two uh, presenters from um, uh, uh, covering climate finance for health systems. We had Prof. Matthew Chesik, who talked about opportunities for sustaining health cl uh, climate and health action in the African region and how to access climate financing. And then we also had Ms. Arini Pantelodov from the Wellcome Trust who briefly described some of the opportunities that are there with regards to uh, climate financing. And in groups, we discussed uh, finance issues in more detail and identified opportunities and challenges for funding around climate finance, for example, research funding, gender gaps in access to funding. We will make sure that all these uh, discussions that we had yesterday are captured and so that you have access to some of the priorities that you've mentioned uh, before, which again, I think feeds into the agenda for the Chance Network going forward. And um, I guess in a nutshell, I hope that I've covered all. Obviously, there was a lot more that was discussed. This is just a snapshot. And, uh, and we, we've got rapporteurs who've captured every single detail of um, yesterday's proceeding, and we will share the notes with you in more detail. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, comments? That was a quick one. With that, um, I'm happy to move on to the next part of the session. Let me get my here. Yeah. So please can I ask uh, panelists, so we have a panel discussion to talk about uh, um, how different um, you know, regions are managing with adaptation, um, adaptation particularly in, in public health facilities. So, Please can I ask the following uh, panelists to come up to the front um, for, for the next session. So, um, Mr. Didakas Namanya from the Ministry of Health in Uganda, if you can come up please, Mr. Didikas. I hope he is here. Okay, or right, maybe he's gone uh, to the bathroom. Um, Ms. Um, Hendiogtiana Rakoto Ramabsen from the Ministry of Health from Madagascar. Thank you. Ms. And, and while the panelists are going up, please, please can I ask that we start uploading their slides for presentation. Ms. Rose Mokaya from the Ministry of Health, Kenya. Ms. Babangila Mthongo from the Department of Health, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. <laughs> Mr. Hendrix Mgodi from the uh, Ministry of Health, Malawi. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Mr. Mkodi and Mr. Namanye. Oh, there. That's Mr. Didika. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. And I'm told that Mr. Mgodi is also on his way. Thank you so much. Oh, and then just uh, once again, welcome to our online listeners as well. Panelists, please take your seats. And I'm going to join them. Yeah. Right. Where's my bio? Oh, yeah. Good morning, panelists. Are you ready? Yes. yes. So, we know and we heard yesterday that Africa is disproportionately affected by climate change. We are not the greatest contributors of greenhouse gas emissions in Africa, and yet we are disproportionately affected by climate change. And so there's a critical need to ensure that we implement adaptation interventions to protect the most vulnerable, as the minister mentioned yesterday. So I'm keen to hear from all of you, and we'll give you each a chance to speak on the progress that has been made in your specific health sectors on adaptation in Africa. So um, what I will do is I will introduce each of you, and then uh, um, you will speak to the, to the topic. Some of you have PowerPoint presentation, and, but we can, be, we can have as informal a discussion as possible. And, uh, and just to get your perspective on the progress that has been made in your region as far as adaptation is concerned. My first question as to Mr. Didakas, and before that, I'm just gonna read your bio quickly. So Mr. Didakas is um, completing his PhD in public health. Mr. Didakas is from uh, Malawi, um, so from Uganda, apologies. Um, he holds an MSc, a master's in public health and BA in geography. Mr. Namanya possesses over 20 years of, of work experience with the Ministry of Uganda National Health Research Organization. He's been leading public health map mapping co-managing international research projects on indigenous health and climate change. He coordinates climate change activities within the Ministry of Health across the public sector and with pub, private and NGO sectors in Uganda, regionally and globally. So welcome, Mr. Didikas Namanye. So if I can hand over to you in terms of your, what's been, what is the progress that has been made with regards to adaptation in Uganda. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for those uh, warm introductions. I would like to start by mentioning the statement which the director of WHO stressed yesterday, that health is the human face of climate change. I would like to say this is a true statement, and taking on from that, I would like to mention that in Uganda, we have made some progress as far as adaptation is concerned. We are in the final stages of doing what we call vulnerability and adaptation assessment. 
and using that information to develop a health national adaptation plan. I would like to mention that to do proper adaptation, there is need to do groundwork, to do research, to do an assessment which can inform uh, right decisions, to develop right interventions in order to do proper adaptation. I would like to say that in Uganda, we have been doing some bit of adaptation, but we thought it is critical to do a vulnerability and adaptation assessment for the whole country in terms of the health sector in order to identify the hotspots of risk, the hotspots of impact, so that we develop interventions which are evidence-based and therefore make an impact by uh, those uh, interventions so that we develop a resilient health system. So we are still in the journey. I think some countries in Africa are still uh, developing that journey. And in this journey, we would like to appreciate the support of the Rockefeller Foundation, which is coming in to support us in financially to develop the, 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 the HNAP and to do the assessment. We are doing a multi-sector approach. We are working with the academia, Makere School of Public Health. They are the experienced people to guide us in doing the research. Uh, we are working with other sectors, Ministry of Water and Environment, because they are the key in climate change, and other sectors, agriculture, so that they give us their experiences so that we can develop a good adaptation plan which we can implement and it has an impact. I think briefly, that's what I can mention yeah. about Uganda for now. This is, this is very fascinating and I like the way the, you've, you know, the collaboration with the multiple stakeholders. So um, have you start, started implementing or what's the status at the moment? We would like to do this assessment as a scientific study, not just the usual rapid assessments. We want to do it systematically, and we have uh, subjected this to ethics approvals. We have submitted the protocols to the mm. uh, Research Ethics Committee. We would like to, out of this assessment, be able to publish papers uh, which can be referenced uh, in, uh, in, in, in journals and can be referred to by any other uh, academia or uh, development partners. So we are at the stage of uh, submission and uh, approvals by the ethics oh. approvals and National Council of Science and Technology. So that out of this information, we can publish and write papers that can guide the global scientific and policy community. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Can I just ask the audience, we will take questions once all the panelists have spoken. So if you can just jot down your questions and then after that I will open it up to the floor to start asking questions. So our next, thank you very much Mr. Namani. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Ms. Hengo Shiana Rakoto Ram, uh, Ramambasan. Uh, I hope I, sp I, I pronounced it correctly. I apologize. Um, she leads work on health and climate in the health and environmental unit in the Department of Health Promotion, Ministry of Public Health, Madagascar. <clears throat> she has a master's degree in management and a master's degree in public health from the National Institute of Public and Community Health. She has worked in the Ministry of Public Health since 2003. She was um, responsible for the plan planification, monitoring, and evaluation of the National Tuberculosis Program, and currently works in the Libreville Declaration Department as the Climate and Health Manager. She has contributed to the updating of various strategic documents, such as the National Adaptation Plan and the nationally determined contribution to. She's a public health specialist. Thank you very much, and over to you. I know you have uh, uh, prepared slides, so please, if you can have our slides up. And you're welcome to, if you want to stand and, and talk to your slides. Thank you. Uh, 
Start the fest. I beg your compassion because I am a francophone speaker, so my English is not uh, very good. Uh, and uh, excellent. Uh, first of all, the Ministry of Public Health in Madagascar has um, uh, signed and adopted all um, our international agreements for uh, climate uh, change uh, and uh, signed all um, declarations. So Madagascar is with uh, our, all of us for fighting about um, climate health. Um, and um, uh, we have uh, a ministry which is um, uh, the lead the co uh, uh, to coordinate all uh, activities about uh, climate change. Um, and um, we have uh, all the uh, strategic uh, documents and um, We have uh, our strategic uh, documents, we have technical documents, we, uh, uh, we have uh, implemented the uh, early warning system, we, we are going through the inventory of um, uh, green gas, uh, greenhouse uh, gas, uh, no, and um, uh, we are going towards what uh, the Agreement and declaration uh, are, um, are setting up in um, in our country. The main um, uh, challenges that uh, we are implementing towards a perspective are um, how we are at the challenging to know. Up and down. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I miss is that uh, Madagascar is an uh, island facing uh, a big hazards, climate uh, hazard as um, cyclones and uh, very violent uh, cyclones, uh, drought in the south of the country and uh, flooding in the highlands and uh, cost um, uh, erosion and uh, something like that. So we are very vulnerable about uh, climate change. And uh, so, oh. <laughs> so um, our challenging, our challenging, our perspective is to our to, we are now doing the inventory of uh, uh, um, the greenhouse uh, gas for, uh, um, to react for, our, uh, for the health sector uh, uh, footprint, carbon footprint. And um, uh, we are, we are um, implementing a climate health early warning system at uh, district level. We have 100 uh, and uh, 100 districts. Uh, we want to, to uh, have a coverage of data and we want to, to reinforce our, um, our collaboration with uh, the meteorological uh, uh, direction for uh, ha 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 for having uh, a meteorological data to couple it with uh, uh, health data uh, to to implement our uh, early warning system and uh, our challenge is to the capacity building of health personnel and community workers on climate change and health and uh, the, the big challenge is to to uh, to promote to research because um, uh, university and uh, unit research uh, are not um, uh, um, implicated um, uh, yet on the 
climate change and uh, the thing that, uh, <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. No, thank you so much. And once again, we will open up the floor um, for questions going forward. Thank you. Our next panelist is Ms. Rose Makaya. Rose Makaya has worked for the Ministry of Health Kenya for over 20 years. She has experience in healthcare waste management, climate change and health pollution con uh, control, infection prevention, and development of strategic plans, uh, as well as policies, strategies, and standards. She has been instrumental in, in the adoption of, a, of clean technologies in the health sector in Kenya for management of healthcare waste through implementation of non-burn technologies by the use of autoclaves and microwaves, shredders, leading to the reduction in carbon footprint um, emissions in the health sector. Um, and secondly, development of the first Kenya climate change and health strategy, um, 2023 to 2027. And thirdly, piloting of the uh, decarbonization of health facilities in 16 counties, which shall be rolled out across the country. Thank you, Ms. Makaya. Over to you. I know you also have your slides, so yes. let's please upload her slides. Thank you. And you did not read my credentials. I beg your pardon? My credentials? Yes. Yes. Right. You, you, you are more welcome to speak to them, yeah. My credentials. You didn't read. Okay. Um, okay. I'm happy for you to speak to the credentials. That's fine. I don't mm -hmm. have them. All. Yeah. Sorry. Entry. Please let's get her slides up. And, and just to add uh, Ms. Makar's credentials, she's a graduate of a Bachelor of Science degree in Health Promotion and Education and a Diploma in Environmental Health Science. And as I said, she's worked for the Ministry of Health uh, of Kenya for over 20 years. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ms. Makar. Thank you. Good morning. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. So in my country, we have done a few uh, initiatives on uh, climate change. the first slide. Okay. Yeah. Kenya, as we know, we had the COP26. Uh, we have the COP20 commitments, which, was, which were made in Glasgow, uh, United Kingdom. So Kenya was among the 52 countries that uh, committed to have a uh, some commitments. Uh, one of the commitments is on uh, to develop a resilient health system. Then uh, also to develop a health system that's uh, sustainable uh, with low carbon emissions. So as a country, uh, we have done a few initiatives. 
Uh, we are implementing an unbanked technology on healthcare waste to manage waste in the healthcare facilities across the country. This is um, a project that started 10 years ago. Uh, we are doing it in phases. So we have finished phase one. We are in phase two for 15 counties. Uh, this support came from the uh, Belgium government. So uh, this will support in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the healthcare <coughs> facilities. Uh, this technology comes with a shredder and a microwave and an autoclave. So this one, uh, it's, an, an auto, uh, uh, it's a, um, a microwave and a shredder. So it shreds waste, then uh, it's um, microwaved. So the second initiative that is we have trained healthcare workers and professionals on the use of uh, decarbon uh, decarbonization tool uh, with support from Aga Khan. Uh, this tool will be used in the healthcare facilities uh, to measure the carbon emissions uh, uh, with plans to upscaling on the same to the whole country because we chose them counties in the, in, the, in, the, in the country. This will create an action plan after the, 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 the use of the, of the tool. It will be used, used to create an action plan to achieve our commitments to, to be a net zero uh, health facility, health, health sector. Uh, we have also come up with the air pollution center of excellence. Uh, the center shall be used to, to monitor air pollution resulting from uh, particulate matter and the greenhouse gas emissions. That's uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, among others. So it's ex expected to support air pollution research across uh, sub Saharan Africa. Uh, region. And this center of excellence is being launched uh, on 1st September by the first lady of the country. And another initiative, the, we have developed a household air pollution uh, training manual. The manual is an advocacy tool for adoption of clean cooking at the community level. And this advocacy tool is being used by the community health uh, workers, promoters, that they need to advocate for the use of the tool to adopt the clean cooking at the community level. At the moment, we, we are developing a, a climate change health strategy, the, the first of its kind in the, in the country, and we are hoping <coughs> to finalize it, then launch at the end of the year. This support from AFDEP, African Institute for Development Policy, they are supporting us to come up with this. So the strategy is a comprehensive uh, roadmap of all adaptation and mitigation actions for the next five years. In the last uh, a few years, we, all, we came up, we developed a Kenya Malaria Early Warning System. This is a real-time uh, system that will monitor malaria epidemics in highland uh, areas or regions of the country. Uh, is the 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 all one is system is still in use the next uh, initiative is uh, we have uh, the health and environment strategic alliance for the implementation of the national plan of joint actions across sectors so we have we shall have a meeting with the health and the environment uh, sector and also we to, what we usually do we uh, inclusion of health sector priority areas in the national climate change adaptation plan uh, the last one we have reviewed that's 2023 2027 the health sector priority areas were included in the in the end cap I, 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 I missed on the one of the initiatives with um, the Minister of Health and Minister of Energy. I've come up with a project to putting up solar system in the underserved counties in the country. The off-grid, the countries which are on the off-grid system of the, of the country. So they have tried to put up some solar systems in the healthcare facilities uh, for use 
that's on the north part of Kenya and some of the coastal region counties. So we have, we have some challenges, the obvious ones, like uh, resources. We have had issues on resources. Uh, with the, the country has some competing uh, priorities, so climate change is a new area that we are trying to fundraise some resources uh, to undertake our activities and programs. So resource al uh, allocation is, a, is, a, is, not the, is, a, is a, a, key, a key challenge. So like now, lack of this has led us not to have the, to undertake the B&A assessment to inform, inform the development of, of the Health National Adaptation Plan as per the COP26 uh, commitments. So uh, Brahma is here. WHO was to support us to do the B&A. Brahma, we have not undertaken this assessment. Please, you need, <laughs> you need to do something about this. We talked about this one year ago at the COP. So we are still waiting for your support. And those on capacity gaps, uh, those, are, those working at the ministry, we are few. So we need some capacity building and also at the county level to, for us to effectively address these climate impacts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shah. And I must commend Kenya for the leadership that you've taken, particularly with green, you know, the measurement of carbon emissions. Um, I know that you know, WHO Afro has been rolling out the tool that's been developed at Aga Khan Health Services to measure these emissions. Thank you very much. You. Our next um, panel speaker, and we're having this presentation. This will be the last presentation, and then Mr. Hendricks will, um, Godi will speak. And then after that, we'll have an informal discussion with the audience. So I'm told that we are live on Botswana TV. So I'm going to ask, it's going to be a bit of a difficult task for you, Ms. Um, Papangile, uh, for you to actually turn around and, and if you can read through, if you can um, view your slides so that people who are watching TV can still see you. <laughs> So if we can have a slice up, uh, but just quickly to read your biography. Um, Ms. Babon Gilliam Slongo serves as the Director of Environmental Health and Communicable Diseases at the KwaZulu-Natal Department of Health. With 25 years of experience in environmental health, she leads the response with the province. She's also a prominent member of the Provincial Climate Change Technical Committee. She leads the KZN Malaria Team, which has been grappling with surge in cases attributed to climate change impacts within the province. Thank you very much, Ms. Papangila. Over to you. Good morning. Uh, I'll just take you through what uh, we have done as, as uh, South Africa, but I'll be biased towards KwaZulu uh, Natal, which is the province where I'm coming from. And I think specifically because we had huge challenges when it comes to extreme weather events, we had floods, we had, I think a, a month ago we experienced a cyclone in just one township in Deben, which is, was a bit strange, uh, but we, we, as a country, we are really uh, trying to, to respond. Uh, for instance, we do have, a, as, as, as I was introduced to say that I'm a member of the Climate Change Technical Committee in KwaZulu-Natal, we have our premier which is leading the response, we currently have the Climate Change Council, which is more of a political structure that is led uh, by the Premier, and under that structure we have uh, the, the, all the members of the Executive Council, which are MECs, uh, participating in, in that structure. Uh, we just had a, a, a meeting a month ago, and we, we, we have a strategic plan that is multi-sectoral. All the departments, including private sector, we have uh, your Imgeni water, your Mutatuzi water, uh, other parastatals also, your Transnet participating in the Climate Change uh, Council in, in, the prov in, the, in the province. Uh, we've just uh, reviewed the, the National Health um, Adaptation Plan. Uh, the initial one was uh, between 2014 and 2019, which was a five-year plan. We have reviewed the plan and we are currently we are currently uh, waiting for the, the DG, which is the Director General of the Department, to approve the, the, the new National Health Adaptation Plan. 
it's currently sitting in, in his office. We're hopeful that it's going to be it's going to be approved and signed for us to, to roll it out. We have um, the, the national uh, I mean the the, the, national, the the heat and adaptation guidelines that have been approved, and uh, we've just done the the rollout to all the, the districts. We have 44 districts in the province in the country. We've done the, the rollout where we were taking them through in terms of what is expected from them, the implications of the, 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 the heat and adaptation and national heat, heat and health uh, guidelines. As, as, as the province, we are, I mean, sorry, as a country, we, we are also working towards the, 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 the climate change indicators. We have a 30, about 13 indicators, but they're still uh, in its draft phases. We are working with uh, the South African uh, Biode National Biodiversity Institute to actually roll out the, the, uh, the, 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 the national set of indicators. We're hopeful that in future we are going to be then be able to, to implement uh, those indicators and they are coinciding with us as a country, implementing the IDSR, which is your integrated disease, uh, so, uh, disease surveillance uh, and response. We have included some few indicators. Uh, we had a huge fight because we needed to come up with the, the priority conditions that we, had, we, we have to report on a weekly basis. So fortunately for us, we will manage to come up with uh, some indicators uh, that will then be, I mean, so disease that would then uh, included in the, in the IDSR. Um, as a country, we've done the, the risk and vulnerability assessments in the 52 municipalities in the country, and the reports are available. We've shared the reports with all the, the, the districts. Uh, we have managed to also in our, our disaster management plan, capture some of the areas that were the findings of the, of the, I mean, the predictions, because we're looking at the extreme weather events and the impact on different uh, conditions using the, 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 the data that the country has available. And we're currently seeing some of those uh, uh, predictions in terms of uh, changes in, in, in disease conditions. For instance, where I'm coming from, in KwaZulu Natal, normally we always uh, say the malaria season is between August and, and, and December. But all of a sudden, we had an upset of malaria cases in March. We had to spray in March. And remember, our spraying season is normally between uh, August and, 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 and December. But all of a sudden, we had an upset of cases. We had to go in those areas. And remember, these are the areas where we've been reported any cases. Of, of malaria for the past five years. So, so we, we are really uh, uh, trying to, to, to implement those. Uh, and learning from COVID, we have done a risk assessment as a country now. And we've looked at the, high, the extreme risk, we've looked at the high risk, and we, we then prioritize the high risk. And it's seven, a uh, 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 high risk, which is your, those, I will just mention uh, three, which will be your floods, it, uh, it's floods, it's fires, and, and storms. And out of those uh, seven risks, we have then developed contingency plans, and of course guided by WHO Afro in responding to those risks, we are establishing the EOCs, the Emergency Operation Centers. Already at National, we are launching in, 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 in October, we, in five provinces, including my province, we are currently also putting up the, the, the EOCs that will be able to respond to all the public health emergencies that are going to be coming our way. And in terms of the, the challenges, we, of course, finances, there will, be never, there will never be enough financial uh, issues, they remain the main challenge. HR issues, they remain the main challenge. And the fact that even the understanding of health workers, we feel that health workers don't really relate to climate change. We are always more responsive whenever there are floods. We will, we will behave as if we've never seen floods. Yet we know that every year we are affected by floods. So our understanding of climate change, it remains a huge challenge uh, for us and, uh, and as the province. Yeah. We also uh, experiencing the, 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 the issues of, of, of uh, the political will, especially at local government level. 
we feel that there isn't enough, poli while the provinces, we have buy-in and, and participation of the MECs, but, they may, but at, at local government level, where actions are supposed to be rolled out, there, there is a, a, a poor understanding. I uh, think uh, that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very, very well articulated. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move along. My um, last panel speaker is seated right next to me as Mr. Hendrix Mugodi. Mr. Mugodi is an environmental health officer with expertise in climate change and human health in the Directorate of Preventative Health Services, Environmental Health Section at the Ministry of Health in Malawi. He has initiated, coordinated, and managed projects related to human health and climate change since 2014 at national level. Um, Mr. Mgodi has more than 25 years experience in public health with a base in health systems. He also has experience working with multi-stakeholder collaborations like the Environmental Affairs Department, Department of Climate Change and Meteorological Services, UN agencies, international organizations, researchers, academia, media, CSOs, NGOs, youth, and many, many others focusing on climate change. Mr. Mgodi. What is, what, what is the progress in, in Malawi? Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to face the audience. Uh, in the first place, I would like to re-emphasize that uh, what my, my fellow uh, panelists have presented, they've almost covered what Malawi is doing, but I was to proceed. Uh, I would like to inform the House that uh, the WHO Health Initiative commitments for COP26, which are being mentioned here, uh, Malawi was the first country in Africa to sign the commitment for the World Health Organization for COP26. We did not a state. Uh, our minister endorsed and made a signatory. Now, let me proceed to so far what Malawi has advanced on human health and climate change in terms of adaptation and the co-benefit measures on climate change and health. Uh, in the first place, I'll talk about mainstreaming climate change into health policy and strategic plan document. Uh, in Malawi, we managed to include climate change and human health in the national environmental health policy document as one of the core thematic areas. Not only that, we have also managed to include climate change and human health in what you call the health sector, strategic plan three, 2023 to 2030, under the social determinant of health, that's climate change is inclusive. Furthermore, we have also lobbied, we have also managed to integrate climate change and human health into what you call the district implementation plan, which for the district council annually, so there's a section whereby in the budget for domestic funding there's some allocation at district level. Um, the other one is about intersector coordination mechanism for climate information. Uh, Malawi as a ministry, we established what you call the Human Health and Climate Change Core Team in 2014, which oversees or coordinates human and health climate change activities in the country, and we usually meet quarterly. And this is the mat sector uh, combination member whereby we have got a composition of academia, faith-based organization, CSOs, NGOs, um, uh, meteorological departments, and other government departments. Those are doing activities related to climate change and health. We have also done what you call the vulnerability and adaptation assessment, which we conducted in 2016, and the report is available. And it has almost expired, and we're intending to do what you call a comprehensive vulnerability and adaptation assessment, and we're currently mobilizing resources to conduct another a detailed comprehensive vulnerability and adaptation assessment on health risks. On capacity building, uh, I'm glad to inform you that we have made some advanced trends on the capacity building. We have managed to include in some uh, training curriculum for health workers. 
like in Malawi, what you call the front line health workers, the health surveillance assistants. There's a climate change and human health module in that curriculum. Not only that, even at the local level, we have managed to put what you call the village health committee, the training manual, a module on climate change and human health. Also on the paramedic training or diploma level on the environmental health officers, there is a curriculum on climate change and human health. That's on capacity building. And also we've made some orientation on health workers across the country. Um, in terms of financing, I would like to say that uh, last year, September, at UNGA in New York, our president met the director general of Green Climate Fund, and they had a discussion to advance some funding for Malawi. And follow up on the meeting in UNGA in September, the director general of Green Climate Fund sent a delegate in December to Malawi to meet our president to mark the way forward on that one. Thereafter, again, a delegate in February, another delegate from Green Crime Fund, technical delegate, came and met technical officers in Malawi to mark the way forward out to unlock the funds for Green Crime Fund. And uh, an EDMA was signed between Malawi government and the Green Crime Fund. And I'm glad that on 31st September, this month, the Malawi government were trying to come up with what you call an investment climate change plan, which is focusing mainly on agriculture, health and education, and energy. Uh, that's about the finance. On the financing part also, I'm glad also to inform that Malawi have made, Malawi government says the Children International have come up with a joint proposal and it is being submitted to Green Climate Fund, uh, amounting to 36 million US dollars, which will be a project once the fund are unlocked from next year. It will be a five years project, 36 million dollars. We are also trying to link up with uh, CHAI. Yeah, CHAI, that's Clinton Health Access Inform Initiative, also to support some funds. Not only that, we have also made a joint proposal with what you call the Seed Global Health, and also uh, in talking relationship with the local fellow foundation, which has been mentioned by Uganda, so that they would like also to put some resources to Malawi. Uh, also, I would like to inform that this week, from 22nd to 24th this month, there was a, a regional African workshop on climate change and human health in Malawi, whereby the AGN, the African negotiators, group of negotiators were invited, and different stakeholders, climate change and health, and they have come up with what you call a common position paper for Africa on climate change and human health. And this common position paper, which has come up, will also be presented by the upcoming African Climate Summit in Nairobi, and our Honorable Minister of Health for Malawi is the one who is going to, make, to present this common position paper to the fellow African ministers on climate change and human health in the in Nairobi summit. And uh, in terms of uh, the carbon emissions, the commitments, Malawi were trying also to reduce the carbon emission in our health facilities. One of uh, the intervention, uh, Malawi is procuring what you call high-tech incinerators to reduce the carbon emission. Not only that, we're even able now to measure uh, the waste which are being generated in our waste facilities so that once we measure before we incinerate them. And the final on that one, we're also trying to advance on the solarization of health facility in terms of the supply chain system for the vaccines and etc. cetera. Uh, lastly, but one in conclusion, what I would like to uh, talk about the take-home the take assignment, uh, the moderator. Uh, in conclusion, what I would like to say that as a health sector, we need to come up to develop what you call a national climate change health policy. This is quite different from what you call the national health, national adaptation plan, but we need to come up with a climate change and a health policy specific. 
Also, secondary, there is need, it's high time we need to establish a climate change and a health unit in the Ministry of Health. That's another suggestion. A thirdly, we need to implement public health measures to protect for the range of climate risks to the health. And fourthly, we need to build better, more resilient, and environmentally sustainable health systems. Uh, also, we need to promote attainable and actionable approaches that both reduce carbon emissions and improve health. Finally, we must look beyond upstream for solutions, starting with building political will and worth in the communities. I thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions from the floor and also questions from online. Um, please can I see by a show of hands any of the questions to any of our panel speakers. When you do um, ask questions, just let us, let us know which organization you represent and please let us know who you are directing the question to. Right. Starting with I see Bettina. I have two questions here from our, from our participants online. The first one is uh, to Didakos in Uganda. How is the project schedule looking and what is the time frame set from assessing impact and adaptation to implement mediation measures or solutions to the findings? And the second one is to... Um, um, is, is about Malawi, we just heard. Cyclone Freddy, and this one is from Sunanda Ray. The previous question was from Dr. Um, Ketepila Taylor. Um, the question from Sunanda Ray is, Cyclone Freddy had a huge impact on infrastructure in Malawi. What kind of intersectoral response was there, both for the immediate impact, but also in building back better? Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question for uh, Malawi, the speaker from Malawi. I, uh, I want to first thank you for uh, trying to uh, integrate this into your uh, district development plans. But I want to find out, the, the health sector, it's uh, guided by policies, guidelines, and protocols. You can do anything about it. How far have you gone in uh, integrating into these policies and standards. My experience is that is the only way you can get them committed to uh, climate change and health. And then the second question is open to uh, all the speakers. I have actually heard that um, all the initiatives so far have been funded by someone else and, and have my challenges with uh, sustainability. Um, beyond that, what are the Beyond the current funding streams, uh, uh, what's the way forward? I ask this because our governments have come to accept that uh, building roads is our responsibility, no matter what it takes. And then again, um, climate change, uh, uh, the effects are localized, so our people feel it. Um, are we going to accept that, okay, even though we, it's unfair that... Uh, we, we did not contribute much to this phenomenon, but we are suffering. I will begin to see it as part of our development, and how can we sustain this? Great. Excellent. We'll take another, seven, another question at the back. We'll take two more, and then we'll ask our panelists to respond. Hello, good morning. And thanks for the panelists for those presentations. I have two questions, and they are open to all the panelists. My first question is that, uh, will the remedies uh, to climate changes be worse than the diseases? Uh, will it drive more people into poverty with higher costs? Because I think we have alluded to many of the remedies that can be um, uh, demystified through some of the climate change, uh, uh, climate change impacts. Uh, so the second question is that, uh, 
doing what needs to be done to combat climate change, uh, does all change come down to the political will? Because we have heard a lot of um, uh, interventions that are geared towards, um, uh, geared towards solving the, the problems of climate change, but does all the changes and um, comes down to the political will, or there is something that can be done actually so that we we really speed up the processes of trying to change the, the climate change and its impacts. Thank you for that. Thank you. One more, and then unfortunately we have for the time we have to get the panelists. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I congratulate all, all presenters. My question goes to a presenter from South Africa. Uh, she mentioned about climate change indicators and the intention to integrate those indicators to IDSCR system. So I would like to know more about it. What are those indicators and how are they going to integrate those indicators to IDSCR systems? Thank you. Yep. Thank you for all the questions. So let's start with uh, Mr. Mgodi from Malawi. The question about Cyclone Freddy and the intersectoral response and also how you planning to integrate um, climate change um, actions into policies and standards. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, did want, I didn't want to mention about the Cyclone Freddy. But anyway, you have brought it in because it's caused quite a lot of bad effects to our country. But anyway, uh, the, way the, the immediate response which our country did, well, the first one was immediately when we encountered the cyclone flood, our excellence, the president, declared the state of emergency immediately. So that soon after the state of emergency was declared, many neighboring countries, other international organizations came in to support our country. Uh, secondly, we also, as a Minister of Health, uh, we started often what you call the emergency medical response, whereby uh, health services, health deliveries were being uh, championed and directed to the affected communities, outreach clinics, uh, even bringing the uh, clinics, closer, the health services closer to the community. Not, uh, not only that, we even, what you call, the, what you call the disaster management contingency plan, which was activated, which means under the office of the president and cabinet, there are some funds for disaster and response system. So the funds were immediately accessed to respond to the effects of climate change and health. Even currently, there's a continuum of the response for the recovery period, both the government the domestic fund as well as the international and the local partners trying to address the issues, the impact of climate change, but which is going to take a long time. And the unfortunate part was that this cyclone flood came in when we were already struggling with a continuum cholera outbreak for more than a year, which hit Malai last year, February, and up to now, it's now trying to subsidize. So it was a combination of problems of health issues. That's about the response of the cyclone Fred. Uh, second, in terms of the integration of the issues into, into the policy, if you remember, I mentioned earlier on that for Malawi, what we did in the first place, we incorporated climate change and health in the national environment health policy. Not only that, we also convened a, a meeting for the senior management team for the Ministry of Health and it briefed them on the importance of the relevance of climate change and health. We also developed some policy briefs on climate change and health. Not on, on, only that, as Malawi, I talked about what you call the Health Sector Strategic Plan 3, 2023 to 2030, which, it is, which is a plan for the Malawi government. Under that strategic plan, human health and climate change it has been prioritized under the social determinant of health in that national strategic plan. Uh, not only that, even in the national determined, determined contribution, climate change and health is one of the priority areas. Also in the country position paper, which will be presented in the COP28 for Malawi, health sector, climate change is one of the priority areas. And the annual budget for Malawi government for Ministry of Health 
There's a small percentage for climate change and health allocation. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, moving on. Um, Mr. Didakas, what is, uh, maybe if you can ask you to respond to the question around the project schedule in Uganda. How are you progressing along? Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't outline the time frame, but the project is supposed to be for six months. Uh, we, I mentioned about the ethics approvals, those are ongoing, and we hope that by the second week of September, this will be done and we shall hit the ground to start the assessment. We hope to have the final report of the assessment by end of October, and then the Health National Adaptation Plan uh, by end of January. We, we intend to share the findings in the COP, COP28 in, in Dubai, but let me also uh, moderator used this opportunity to mention that in Uganda we have some other initiatives that we have taken uh, which uh, are not of course in the HNAP but we have been doing some initiatives and interventions. For instance uh, basing on last year's uh, uh, World Health Day the theme was on climate change and health, keeping the planet healthy. So we based on this to do awareness in the whole country by urging all the health facilities to plant trees. And we did a pilot in the city, Kampala city, and the neighboring district, where we went and educated the health workers at selected health facilities and planted trees. We educated them about climate change and the impacts and how the health sector can actually reduce emissions. Uh, I also have to mention that we have participated in all the policy developments. The National Climate Change Policy has a very big section on health. Uh, the NDCs in Uganda have got a big section on, on health. And the national communications to the UNF C have a section on health. So we have not been sitting. We have been working and making sure that health is well represented. And now with the, 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 the opportunity of the COP acknowledging health, the sky is the limit. We are going to continue to pursue uh, the issues and uh, locally and globally. Thank Over you. you. Thank you. The sky is the limit indeed. Um, and then I'm going to progress on to the next question for South Africa. Um, uh, we, we we're running out of time, it's 10.45, but we're going to steal a bit of a um, few minutes from the tea time. Um, so, uh, Ms. Babangile, talk to us about indicators in South Africa. How are we doing that? Briefly. Thank you. In terms of the, the climate change health indicators, for instance, I'll talk about two, and how do you link that with ITSR? We, we, for instance, we have indicator on, on diarrhea that monitors diarrhea. We have an indicators that talk to malnutrition. And in terms of the priority conditions now that we, we've selected for IDSR, we, diarrhea is included in those conditions that are then supposed to be reported on a weekly basis. And there's also an, an, an indicator that looks at malnutrition. And we've also included malnutrition as part of the... The, the, the conditions that would then have to be reported on the, on the IDSR. So that is the link that we have between the proposed health indicators and what is on the priority list on, on IDSR. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So I have, well, three, but I will restrict it to two questions for all the panelists. And if I can ask each of the panelists to respond to the two questions just briefly. The, one, the first question is on you know, funding, you know, what, what are you thinking about in terms of beyond the existing funding stream? So it's, it's, a, it's a question around sustainability, isn't it? Uh, beyond current funding. So in your area, what are, you know, are the thoughts around uh, what happens when the current funding comes to an end? And the second question is political will. Uh, it all comes down to political will. So, so what is the political will 
in your respective countries to ensure that the actions are also sustainable. Thank you. Starting with you, Ms. Mukai. Okay. Thank you. On the issues of uh, sustainability, like the, the Nanban technology, what we have done, we have two levels of government. We have the national and the county governments. So what we have discussed with the county governments, they need to include some um, budget in the CIDPs, the County Integrated Development Plans for, for maintenance and uh, 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 maintenance and uh, how do we call it? For maintenance of the machines. So our work at the national, as, a, as the national government was to get the machines for the counties, let the counties do the maintenance of the operations budgets. And on the political will, uh, we have seen the ministry and the president himself uh, supporting the ministry, uh, allocation of funds for climate change activities and programs. So in our work plans, we have seen the allocation, especially for this financial year, we have seen allocation of funds for climate change and the health programs, something which was not there. Thank you. Wonderful. Over to you, Ms. Ramabasan from um, Madagascar. Yes, uh, for Madagascar, um, politically will is uh, become, becoming uh, a support of uh, uh, climate change because uh, even a uh, uh, government uh, doesn't have uh, enough uh, funding uh, for supporting the activities in the field. Uh, political realism um, um, helping, helping us to implement as uh, they can the uh, intervention about the climate health. I, I, I want to, to share with you that uh, one thing that we are proud of is our um, uh, bulletin, uh, monthly bulletin uh, climate health that uh, have uh, for the early warning system uh, that the uh, government uh, does what uh, it can to, to spread that uh, early warning system that uh, so community in the base can have an idea what can help, or what can happen um, uh, about uh, climate, uh, climate hazard, about uh, what uh, diseases will increase in the uh, becoming month. And uh, I think that uh, the government is supporting us uh, uh, well. well. Well, OK, great. Thank you so much. Moving on to South Africa. Thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, funding in the country, I think firstly just to say that the four cities, uh, the 40 cities concept has assisted, assisted a lot already in the, in the country. Five uh, metros have established um, the, the climate change units that are funded by those respective municipalities. And we are expected as, as, as departments to make provision in terms of our funding of the climate change initiatives in our department. And in terms of the political will, I think at province, as I've said, there is political will, there is political leadership in terms of the, the premier leading the climate change council. At national level, I think there's also a, a political will. Currently, there is a climate change bill that is about to be proclaimed. And I think it shows that uh, the, the, there is commitment from our politicians in making sure that there are responsibilities that are given to different uh, levels of government in terms of what is contained in the climate change bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to Uganda. Thank you. Uh, the question on funding is very, very important. How sustainably can we maintain the funding for climate change? I think we should take a view of uh, tapping on all the possible sources of funding. We shouldn't limit ourselves to the government. We shouldn't limit ourselves to development partners. We should combine all these sources of funding so that we tap into every possible funding stream. Uh, although the government should take the lead to, you know, uh, include a budget, in Uganda, the 
the government has made sure that they will put in some money in supporting the climate change uh, initiatives in the health sector. But beyond this, we are trying to tap into other sources. For instance, we are already working on uh, a program with UNDP and WHO to come up with funding specifically for some uh, interventions. That is one way. Uh, beyond that, we think the districts should integrate climate change initiatives in their budgets, and we have included this in their planning guidelines, uh, how to integrate climate change in their activities and, and, and responses. The issue of political will, this one the government is very strongly behind uh, supporting climate change uh, and responses. We have the national climate change policy. We have even a law, Climate Change Act, which urges everyone to be responsible. So that is an initiative that shows strong political will. And even the 2026 COP um, commitments really demonstrate that the Ministry of Health and the government is committed to uh, tackling climate change in the health sector. So I think the Thank commitments you. are there. That's great. And lastly, briefly, Malawi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I already alluded earlier on in terms of the financing that uh, our, our presence was already committed, has made different speeches on new health and climate change internationally globally on different summits. And I also indicated that they had decided side the meetings, the Global Climate Fund, that's about financing Malawi. Uh, also, our minister is very dedicated and very committed on issues to do with climate change in most of global international forums, even at local level, very supportive of us. So for Malawi political will, we have reached there, we have got a support, full support for the political will. Now, in terms of sustainability, in, in terms of, uh, yeah, that's about, now sustainability of financing. Uh, in Malawi, currently, we have what you call, Malawi is determined or dedicating some domestic funding from the annual budget for the country, from Office of the President and Cabinet. Secondly, also, Malawi, uh, that was March this year, our president launched the carbon market where Malawi will be benefiting. And some of the money will be for the climate change activities and the Minister of Health will be benefiting from the carbon market. Uh, efforts. Also for the carbon levies, uh, our country do collect the carbon levies within the country and because of carbon levies it uh, has been agreed by the Malay government that part of that money should be channeled to climate change interventions and the Minister of Health is uh, qualifying to apply for that funding. And finally Malawi has come up with what you call the National Climate Fund whereby the office of the president annually is allocating a fund for climate fund for the government sectors who are championing climate change to access some funds. I thank the moderator. Thank you very much. We would have liked to take more questions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. If you do have questions for the panelists, I ask that you um, get hold of them um, during tea time um, for further discussions. A round of applause for our panelists, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so we will close the session. Then um, we will now break for tea. The next session will begin promptly at 11.15. Thank you. See you at 11.15 in this room. Thank you very much.
One, two. Will I be seeing the slides on the screen here? You have? No, I don't have it. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, sorry to rush you with your, with your tea and to rush you back into the room. But, but we, are, we are fighting against time. Um, so from yesterday's session, we, um, we missed one of the presentations in the, in the climate financing sessions. And um, because, please everybody, let's have, let's have one meeting. Thanks everybody, let's have one meeting please. So thank you for coming back. So in catching up from yesterday's session, um, we really didn't want to lose out on the presentation from one of our, our key speakers, uh, Dr. Brahma. Many of you know him from the WHO. So this is the presentation that fills into the last session from yesterday under the climate uh, session. Many of you know Dr. Brahma as, as a technical officer in charge of climate and health at WHO Afro in Congo, Brazzaville. By training, he's an associate professor in sanitary engineering and environmental epidemiology. Um, and he sits on many of these uh, important public health councils, including the African Malagasy Council for Higher Education. Before joining WHO Afro, uh, Professor Kone was a researcher and a lecturer in Cote d'Ivoire and in Togo. He was the project leader at the Swiss Center for Scientific Research in Cote d'Ivoire, and his research in interests include climate and adaptation. Um, he's also authored and co-authored many publications, and many of you will have come across those publications. And currently, he sits on the steering committee for the Future Earth Health Knowledge Action uh, Network, which is HealthCAN since 2010. So thank you very much. Uh, Professor Brahma, I'll give it to you. Thank you so much. Um, may I see my slide on this screen, or shall I go there to see them? Can I see them on this screen? No? If not, I will move. Just give me a mic, uh, we will not lose too much time. I, will, I can move. Can't move it, but it's what the online participants are seeing. They're actually seeing the slide. Would that this work? One. Okay. Would that work? I just move the participants so I can make this a full screen. You can't move this. I can move it, but it's. Just, but but it's just, so. Thank you so much, Bettina. Always so helpful. Thank you so much. So I will be going through a few slides, uh, presenting you what WHO uh, Afro region is doing uh, related to climate change and health. So Next slide, please.
Wonderful. Let us make it more easier for you guys. So, few stats related to climate change and health in our region. For the last decade, almost 2,000 public health emergencies were recorded. And around 56% were climate related, showing you how important are climate related health emergencies in our region. When you compare the last decade records to the previous one, we got an increase of almost 25% of climate related health emergencies. So the stress we are already facing is also increasing showing that we are already in a problem, but this problem is getting more complicated for us. Third thing, when you look at those emergencies, many of them are water related. We're talking about flooding events, cyclones. Draft is also water related. Flooding, excess of water, Draft, we don't have water. So all of them are water related. Sorry. We used to start with this statement of our regional director. Climate change is the greatest threat to humanity. And the entire foundation of good health is in jeopardy with increasingly severe climatic events and in Africa, frequent food and water and vector-borne diseases deepen health crisis. Although we know it, the continent contributes the least to global warming, it bears the full consequences. But it's not just a matter of saying we are victims. It's a matter of how we cope from this situation to still live in dignity. Even someone who treats you, no need for you to come and say, I'm victim of what you are doing. You better start thinking to what you can do and for him to realize he made something that is complicating your life and morally, he need to come and support you. If you are coming with a discourse of saying, this is due to you, you are doing this, even in our families, we are not always equitable in doing things. So this is not the matter. The matter is how each of us try to recover from a stress is facing. And this is your first responsibility. We can discuss and debate on everything. We will not change how the world has been moving forward so far. We need to take our future in our hands and see how we can build it more strongly and more effectively. And if the ones who are responsible of it come and support us, that's fine. If they are not coming, let us show that we can deal with our future ourselves. This is our responsibility. Rapidly, if you start 250,000 deaths per year due to climate change, and only for malnutrition, malaria, diarrheal diseases, increase in population at risk of malaria worldwide and mainly in Africa, decline in crop productions, so coming with famine, malnutrition, we are already facing loss of economic, economic loss, 1.5 to 3% of a global GDP per year from Africa, from countries that are already weak economically. 7.5 million of internal displacement. And yesterday I was hearing from colleagues from South Africa, and to be honest, this was my first time to hear that, and I was so happy to hear it. How climate change is related to increasing TB I say, ah, really? Yeah, 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 because due to flooding events, people are getting closer in those displacement areas, and the ones with TB are contaminating harvest, transmission increase. These are concrete, real things we are facing in our regions, and we need to face them. 
And for sure, in next future, we will have more persons displaced due to those climate-related events. Let me resume it by saying we are all vulnerable in our region, but some are more vulnerable than others, mainly women, children, elder people. How are they more vulnerable? When we look at vector-borne diseases, health issues in families in our African region are generally managed by who? By our mothers, our moms, by women. So this is coming with more work, more burden of work for our moms, taking care of people who are getting ill. So any increase of one more additional malaria cases in the family is giving additional work to the mom. These are concrete things that are talking to us. When we look at water, who are going to seek for water? Again, ladies, women. And it's well demonstrated that in some region of Africa, girls are get out from school because they have to go in the morning and fetch for water. If we are getting less water, we are increasing the work. And we are putting more burden on ladies. When we look at air pollution, when we are outside, yes, we are all exposed to the same pollution coming from cars, from all whatever thing. When we come in household, who is in the kitchen? Again, our moms. They will be exposed to those charcoal, firewood in kitchen, and we will be waiting for good food. <laughs> and sometimes we even complain because the food is not enough good. Agriculture, when they are distributing the lands, the less productive lands are given to moms. Ah, please, uh, you don't come and disturb us. Just, just take this spot of land and do what you want to do on it. So when due to climate change, when due to lack of water, all the lands are under stress, imagine how the less productive lands are and how productivity for our mother work will be. So again, more vulnerability. When it comes to those extreme events, and I really like this picture, we can see the ladies taking all the luggage and her fathers behind just walking, following them. But that will be fun if the ladies were the one who know how to swim. But generally, tell me, when they are kids, who used to go and learn to swim in water ponds? Generally, the boys, because the ladies are with the moms in kitchens. So at the end of the day, they are the ones just walking. And if there is a problem here, I'm sure my dad will just look at how to disappear from here. <laughs> but anyway. So what WHO is doing Everything is settled under programmatic tools, under institutional documents. And that's starting with this Libreville Declaration on Health and Environment. I think when the lady from, I think it was from South Africa, it was from Kenya, when she was talking from Kenya, my dear sister from Kenya, she talked about the NPGA, the National um, Partnership Joint Actions. These are kind of thing, acronyms that are coming from the implementation of the Libreville Declaration. It starts by setting a joint text team in countries. These are transdisciplinary, transversal teams made of people from health sector, environment sector, research sectors, and all those thing, persons are looking to health challenge in countries and coming with concrete joint actions to face the challenge. So, two other documents. The framework for public health adaptation in our region 
and they just adopted strategy for environmental management in our region. These are two other documents that are pushing forward our work in the Afro region. From the COP26 health commitment, you may already, you may have heard it in the speech of the regional director. We do have 24 countries already in our region that have committed. In the 66, now 72 countries that are committed worldwide, 25 are from Africa region. And to implement this COP26 health commitment, we come with this mechanism that is called the ATTACH, the Alliance for Transformative Actions on Climate Change. And the ATTACH helped implement the COP26 initiative through two main activities. Support the implementation of resilient health system and support the implementation of low carbon sustainable health system. The resilient health system is nothing than doing your VNA, drafting your HNAP, raising funds to implement your HNAP. The sustainable low carbon health system is nothing than measuring your health system ga uh, uh, gas emission, draft roadmap to decarbonize the health system, raise funds to implement the roadmap. These are the two main activities in the ATTACH initiative. So it's nothing more than what we used to do, but we put it in two specific concrete chain to move forward with. And I know my time is over. Let me then go rapidly to the end. So this is how we are supporting countries, mobilizing funds, capacity building, trainings, drafting readiness proposal to raise funds with a GCF, Green Climate Fund, advocating to get more countries coming on board. And we are waiting for the letter to come from Botswana in the next week. And after the regional committee, I cannot take my flight back if I didn't get this Botswana coming on board. I know the representative of Botswana are here. Do what you can do because we cannot move forward with you. Our regional director is taking lead on this in the African region. And if I'm curious, I would like to know what is going on in the home country of my regional director. Please, let us get Botswana on board of this process. We cannot wait more, please. Let's do it. She's here actually for the regional committee. I will be so glad to tell her regional director Botswana came on board because you gave this speech at the conference. So please, people from Botswana, you get it said, make it for us. And I will end by this attach initiative. We have four working group, building resilience, raising funds for decarbonization, climate and nutrition that just came on board, supply chain to support all this process, and finance. Thank you. And Rigo, I'm sorry, I know I take a bit more time, but I'm really happy and glad to be here to share those few things with you, and I'm awaiting any question to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kona. I think everybody benefited from hearing that presentation, um, and I think it's worth stealing from our lunchtime and giving you a little bit more time for questions. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes for questions. So let's take five questions. Let's take five questions all together um, and, and then transition into the next session. Can I see a show of hands for any questions? There's one at the back over there, two at the back. Three. Um, the grown-ups than it is the youth 
at large. And may I just say, when you look at it, essentially, the people who are out there and driving all of this, the people that usually are out there consuming and, you know, taking part into, in the society and community is usually the young kids and so, so as the youth. So I'd say that how do we best integrate? Because the only thing that we get is just basic, don't throw litter around. You know, you never really, the kids don't really understand what it is that we're trying to communicate. They don't really understand until, you know, they've already adopted these old habits or they're pretty, you know, difficult to break at a certain, pay, at a certain point. So that is my question. Thank you. Let's take the next question, Fortuna. And you the last. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Brahma. That was a very nice presentation. So as you presented, I kept on thinking about, perhaps from your experience, how do you suggest we deal with the complex dynamics um, of responsibility, authority, uh, capacity building, resource allocation that would seem to, to be the main issue that would prevail, particularly if an activity of integration falls within the purview of two government entities, for example. So you would see that when we're talking about building resilient health systems, you're really talking about the Minister of Health, but perhaps also the Minister of Local Government, Minister of Environment, you need these very strong government entities to be able to work together. You also need the Minister of Finance to be there. How do you deal with these dynamics of authority and power and, you know, that always prevail when you, we start talking about decision making? Thank you. Just from your experience, thanks. Yeah. Let's take another question. Um, thank you very much, Brahma, for that presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, because here, yeah. <laughs> sorry, if WHO has always been quite supportive of chance and some of the activities that we undertake, yeah. even through the Clean Health um, Initiative, and we wanted to ask, I know WHO is doing a lot of work with the commitments, ETC, and you have a lot on your plate, and my question to you is, how can we as chance sort of step in to help you uh, bring some of these things into fruition? Thank you. Great question, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Professor Britt Next at University of Botswana. I'm dealing with the smallest and newly born babies. And um, I've done that for many, many years, and now the climate questions. So I, I was just thinking when you presented the vulnerable groups, uh, because a lot of us, we don't think so much about the smallest babies. But the newly born babies in the poor settings, they are very vulnerable. The death rate for these, pe these small ones are seven to ten times higher in, in Africa than in the adult population and even for the pregnant woman and, and all this. And, and they also stay with the mom all the time. When they are cooking indoors, they inhale this gas. They are at the back of the, uh, the mom when she's walking one and a half hours to get water and is exhausted. And her malnutrition affects the baby too. So I would like more initiative for the smallest little ones. And if I can help in any way with my expertise, I would be so happy. And we have been looking into this in the Chamna project, which is now ending soon, but I would very much like to continue this work. But it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Brahma. Thank you so much, Professor. And the last question from here, before you can answer. Thank you very much, Professor, for your presentation. My question is that uh, you have outlined the structures of attach. I see in the last slide you mentioned some working groups, but there are countries mentioned there. How do other countries like Uganda participate in this uh, initiative? Is it ring-fenced for those countries? 
or it is open to other countries. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, good question. So the two first questions, integrate the strategy to consider lower generation. And the second one, responsibility, authority, research allocation, multi-sectorial work in countries. All those issues, very relevant issues, are interconnected. The multi-sectorial work, if it's really multi-sectorial, it will consider lower generation. It will consider new bonds. It will consider finance, development, Ministry of Health, Environment, and all those ministries and countries. The great thing is that in our region, and honestly, this has been recognized everywhere. Our initiative through the Libreville Declaration was an unprecedented one. It pushed countries forward to set up locally those multi-sectorial joint test team. And any country where those joint state teams are working efficiently and effectively, we do observe a dynamic in how they are moving forward with the COP26 initiative right now. I'm not surprised by the example presented by Kenya. And to be honest with you, Kenya is one of the countries in the region that is leading this process. So we need to learn from countries that are making the difference. What are they doing exactly that we are not doing? Definitely, Kenya has been leading the Libreville Declaration implementation in the region most effectively. And we do encourage other countries to do so. Because any country where you have such transdisciplinary, multi-sectorial working group that are functioning. Any environmental climate related issue is analyzed in this group and is considering all the vulnerable groups and trying to come out with solutions for them. And this is why I also appreciate the, what Amit was saying when it came to the VNA from Uganda. He said that we want to make it not as a traditional VNA. We not make it led by scientists, by researchers, by. This does not mean scientists are the one who will alone sit in the bureau and make it. This means that based on the methodology those scientists know, they will definitely reach toward people that can give the good information to come out with VNAs that are considering all other sectors. Not only disease-related VNAs, but VNAs considering nutrition issue. And when it comes even to those diseases, VNAs considering newborn issue, considering elders, how to come out with those well-connected, integrated VNAs? Because from there, the Health National Adaptation Plan you will draft will then consider all the channels at country level. So this is what I can say on those two questions. How chance will bring someone, uh, will, will, will bring all the potential here to what is going on at the WHO level? But we were so lucky to have two ladies coming from chance to attend our clean health meeting in Libreville two weeks ago. Only coming with a gender perspective is already enough something for us. To have two ladies joining this group of <laughs> machos, I would say in bracket, we were more than happy to have you. So if chances can continue bringing us ladies to join our meetings, we are already more happy. But it goes beyond that because you contributed efficiently to this meeting. You even play a role of reporters, I remember. The only thing that remains now is just for Champ to jump in the swimming pool, being official member of the Clean Health platform, 
and then we move forward together. It's just a matter of sending a, a, a message, and from there, we start swimming together. Last thing, other countries to participate. Yes, you did it. You, you catch it rapidly, but due to time concerns, I could not develop it more. Those countries are just the countries leading the working group, and this is just for one, two years. After this, we will have to change the countries to get other countries coming on board and leading the working groups. So it's just a matter of candidates coming from those countries. We have seen the process, and we would like to lead one working group in. And the members decided, and when I say the member, WHO, HQ, and us, we discuss it and see if it's relevant for this country or this institution to come on board and lead it. So this is how we, we made it. I think I answered to all questions. I didn't come specifically to the newborn one because for me this is really transversal. And you give so great example. Our mom, when they are in the cheek kitchens, the mom are vulnerable, but we easily imagine that the newborn are more vulnerable than even the moms. So what you are saying is so true. And last year, if you remember, we discussed it already when I was attending the first chance meeting. So this is really, we are happy to have you with us, and we shall continue together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so this is, this is an interesting question for us. So if climate change, if health is the face of climate change, then that face needs a voice. We are the voice. The people in this room are that voice. And that voice consistently needs to be raised so that all of these issues are, are, are heard in these different fora for climate and health action. Climate and health action will not happen unless we bring the issues to the fore. And that is what, for me, the Chance Network is. It's about using our voice and to continue using our voice. And that kind of brings us into the next session. And the next session is all about cross-sectoral approaches for population health. So we've heard yesterday that we don't we, we can't even rely on um, multi-sectoral cooperation. It needs to be trans-sectoral cooperation. And, and we're going to hear a thought starter from uh, David and BC to begin with, to begin thinking about how that is happening in reality at a very high level, at the, at the African ministerial level. And then we're going to start, and, we, and from that high level, we're gonna bring it all the way back down to ourselves at the personal level and ask ourselves personal uh, questions about this, this idea of cross-sectoral approaches. So just a quick introduction to David. I've known David now for about 10 years from working on chemicals and waste at, at UNEP. Um, David has over 15 years experience on issues related to environmental governance and policy and strategy development. Um, and the interlinkages with environmental impact assessment and health. Um, he also works in waste management and environmental education. The thing that he's going to share with us is his work with the African ministers in charge of the environment to promote regional cooperation in addressing these environmental issues and advancing African interests on environment and sustainable development and setting the environment agenda in Africa. Um, he is a Kenyan national. He holds uh, various postgraduate degrees, a master's degree in environmental planning and management, um, a diploma in environmental planning and management from, from Galilee College, a certificate in integrated environmental management from Bath University. And he's previously been the lead environment impact assessment expert in Kenya. And he's also an associate member of the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment in the UK. Thank you, David. Please come forward. Thank you very much. Um, before I get into my presentation, I wanted to begin with a question in terms of um, this room as chance members. Um, I don't know if anyone has noticed that in as much as we are talking about climate change 
environment, and health, we are in a way contributing to the problem. Could someone tell me why? Yes? Uh huh. What else? <laughs> Water bottles. What else? Yep. Um, not really. Not really. Uh, yeah, the air condition. Uh huh. What else? <laughs> okay, and one more last. Uh, yeah, I've heard about the bottles. But what are we putting on our necks? All right. Uh, that's a, a discussion for another day. But. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to yeah, quickly go through some of the points that I have. And uh, thank you, Brahma. I think he has made my work easier. Uh, he has touched on some of the aspects that I was going to uh, really share with you. Uh, move on to the next slide. Yeah, so I'm sure that uh, all of you are already aware in terms of the link between environment and, uh, and our human health. And you are aware of some of the environmental risk factors that uh, impact or contribute to uh, ill health. You are also aware of some of the drivers that contribute to this, including uh, climate change that we're talking about, biodiversity loss, pollution, urbanization, our changing lifestyles. And you're also aware that over the last uh, many years, there have been a lot of improvements in terms of human health, in terms of people living longer. But of course, we still continue to experience uh, challenges with environmental degradation. And more recently, we are all aware of the COVID-19 and what it did to us. And of course, when you look at the origins of COVID, it's all related to uh, our interaction between human animals and the environment. Now, I wanted to share some data or some figures, which I know most of you already uh, are aware of. Uh, looking at air pollution alone, uh, in terms of uh, its impact globally, we have about 7 million people dying every year as a result of air pollution. You have about 4.3 million people dying as a result of household air pollution. We just heard about, you know, the cooking, you know, firewood in the kitchens and all that. We have issues related to lack of access uh, to clean water, sanitation issues that also contribute uh, to human loss. We have exposure to things like asbestos and uh, you know lead and other chemicals, which is also a major issue. And then of course, climate change being a major health risk uh, multiplier. We just heard of uh, you know heat waves, uh, we've talked about floods, uh, we've talked about malaria being uh, present in areas that uh, originally did not have malaria as a result of the warming of those areas. Now, as a result of this, and uh, thanks to Brahma, um, governments, particularly ministries of environment and Ministry of health, came together to try and see how they can work together uh, to address uh, to address some of these challenges, and this gave birth to the Libreville Declaration. This was the, actually the first inter-ministerial uh, meeting 
uh, between the two sectors, which took place in 2008, and where the ministers adopted the Libreville Declaration, uh, which was basically aimed at uh, catalyzing policy, uh, looking at institutional arrangements, uh, investments, as well as uh, the reducing environmental risk factors uh, that contribute to ill health. Within that declaration, there were priority uh, action areas which the ministers agreed to uh, implementing, um, really focusing on strengthening systems, expanding resources, availability of resources, uh, improving capacity. We've talked about capacity building here since yesterday, as well as uh, improving coordination uh, and collaboration, which of course we are talking about. During that meeting, they committed to establishing um, Health and Environment Strategic Alliance as a basis for joint plans of action. Uh, we heard about that from Kenya. Uh, and of course, agreed to meet again. And the second meeting of that uh, inter-ministerial uh, meeting happened in 2010 in Angola. In terms of providing support uh, for the implementation of the Libreville Declaration, uh, UNEP and WHO came together to establish a joint task team, which then proceeded uh, to support uh, member states in terms of the implementation of the uh, Libreville Declaration. As I mentioned, the second uh, interministerial meeting took place in 2010. And during this meeting, there were three key outcomes of, um, uh, of the meeting. One was the Luanda commitment on implementation of the Libreville Declaration. The second one was on arrangements for the Health and Environment Strategic Alliance. And thirdly, and more importantly, was the joint statement on climate change and health. This was the first time that, you know, the two sectors were coming up with a joint statement that was presented um, uh, to the Conference of Parties, that's the Climate Change Conference of Parties, uh, COP16, that took place in Mexico uh, during that year. The Luanda commitment uh, had a number of priority areas, um, including addressing the issue of safe drinking water and sanitation and hygiene, uh, looking at air pollution and clean en energy, uh, issues related to chemicals and waste, uh, climate change, of course, was uh, part of a, that priority, uh, vector control and health uh, in the workplace. I would like to add that after that, in 2011, um, the ministers of uh, health and environment um, uh, agreed to implement the framework for public health adaptation to climate change uh, following a resolution of the WHO Regional Committee for Africa, as well as a decision of AMSEN. Now, AMSEN is the African Ministerial Conference on Environment. This is a forum that brings together all ministers of env environment in Africa. And as UNEP, uh, we provide secretariat to this particular forum. And I'm actually the one who is coordinating the secretariat of this forum. We've just come uh, back from Addis Ababa last week where we had uh, the 19th session of the African Ministers of en Environment meeting in Addis. Now, quickly, I just wanted to take you through some of the things that happened after the 2010 uh, second interministerial conference. Already we have a, a living example here Kenya provided. Uh, of course, Malawi also made reference to that, as well as uh, Madagascar. In terms of countries establishing what we call uh, the country task teams, uh, with the support of WHO uh, and UNEP, and this brought together uh, different uh, uh, sectorial um, you know, uh, sectors within the countries, not only ministries of health and environment, but other relevant sectors were also involved in some of the countries. Of course, Kenya was given as a good example of that. Uh, there were ministries of agriculture involved, energy, water. There was Academia University of Nairobi involved in that. There were a number of private sector uh, involved. And all those contributed uh, to the development um, of what we call the situation analysis and needs assessment. Basically, they undertook an assessment to see what is the status of things with regard to how uh, the two sectors, environment and health, uh, were collaborating. And a number of uh, 
recommendations as well as the state of uh, play uh, was provided through uh, this document. That's the situation analysis and needs assessment. And that helped the countries then move on to develop joint plans of action. So this exercise was done in a number of African countries. I think um, about 37 countries went through this exercise and developed their national uh, plans of uh, joint action. So this really um, helped in terms of um, encouraging and enhancing the collaboration between the two sectors in uh, the different African countries. But of course, as a, um, a way of feedback, you know, working with those countries, we did get um, a, a feedback as well. Um, and we realized that there was uh, slow progress reported on our allocation of budgetary resources. An assessment of the ministries of uh, environment, for example, on average in African countries, showed that uh, from the national budget, it's barely 1% that is allocated to ministries of environment. Of course, ministries of health get a little more allocations, but again, you'll find that the ministry of health get more allocation to deal with um, reactionary sort of um, uh, issues in terms of treating the diseases. Yet, if some resources were provided to sort of contain or be able to address some of the causes of these diseases, then you'll find that ministries of health will not end up using so much resources to deal with, um, with the diseases. Now, in terms of um, uh, supporting, one of the other issues was, of course, uh, related to data and research and all that. And therefore, in 2013, uh, UNEP uh, released a publication, the African Environment Outlook 3, uh, which was focusing on the interlinkages between health and environment. So this report uh, provided a comprehensive, reliable, and scientifically credible assessment of the state of environment in Africa with a focus on impacts on health. It also identified areas where data uh, and information was lacking and, of course, made uh, some recommendations in terms of uh, improving uh, data collection. Now, um, moving on quickly, um, in 2016, um, there was a ministerial declaration on health, environment, and climate change, which was adopted at COP22 uh, in Marrakesh in 2016. I put in these uh, just to share with you that there is already a basis in terms of the link between uh, environment, health, and climate change. And as we discuss here among ch chance members, we can easily then build on some of the, uh, you know, uh, work that has already been done, some of the awareness that has already been created to move forward in terms of uh, really influencing the outcomes of the conference of parties related to climate change, and of course, uh, enhancing and um, uh, the linkages between climate change and health. From the UNEP side and working, of course, with other uh, partners, particularly WHO and the Climate and the Clean Air Coalition, there is a campaign that we call Breathe Life uh, Campaign, uh, which is a global campaign to mobilize cities and individuals to take action on air pollution. I don't know if some of you or most of you have noticed now, if you go to major cities around Africa, you'll find that there are air quality um, uh, sort of machines or air quality gadgets that have been installed uh, within the cities that helps in terms of monitoring the air quality uh, within those cities. So it's part of this campaign to really help in terms of cities getting to know uh, uh, their state of uh, air quality. Uh, in 2018, two major things also happened where UNEP and WHO uh, um, agreed on a memorandum of understanding for joint actions to combat air po pollution, uh, climate change, and antimicrobial resistance. The issue of antimicrobial resistance is now uh, becoming a major issue within the African continent and beyond. Uh, and as a matter of fact, last year during the AMSEN meeting, 
Uh, this was discussed uh, within, uh, among the ministers of environment and agreed that there is need to create more awareness about the issue of antimicrobial uh, resistance. This is a case where, of course, uh, most of us get to the uh, pharmacies and uh, buy, you know, um, uh, medicine, which of course then uh, there is resistance. It doesn't really work uh, in some cases. Um, UNEP also, uh, with WHO and uh, World Meteorological Organization, launched a global coalition on health, environment, and climate change, basically focusing on uh, reducing uh, the deaths caused by environmental risks, particularly uh, air pollution. And of course, uh, in 2018, uh, uh, we are aware that WHO launched a special report on health and climate change at COP24. Uh, to really highlight health considerations as critical to advancement of climate action. This again just shows you that there is uh, efforts that have been made to really try and influence uh, particularly the outcomes of uh, uh, the climate change uh, negotiations. Now, in 2018, uh, we had the third interministerial uh, conference on health and environment, again taking place in Libreville. Uh, and during this particular third interministerial conference, um, the ministers adopted a strategic action plan for 2019 to 2029 uh, with the aim of scaling up uh, health and environment interventions. One of the focus of this um, uh, strategic plan was to see how to increase investments and accelerate joint health and environment priorities. As we've discussed since yesterday, one of the issues uh, has been uh, the challenge of resources. I remember yesterday we were talking about climate finance as it relates to health. So this is one of the challenges, uh, one of the purpose of the strategic plan was really to see how to increase investments that would help in addressing these issues. Of course, uh, some of the other issues related to the strategic plan, which is of course available, was on how to strengthen policy frameworks and institutional mechanisms, uh, build infrastructure, technical institutional capacities for joint uh, capacity building. Capacity building was an issue that has been raised. Um, the issue of um, surveillance systems uh, was also raised. Uh, the issue of uh, research agenda, uh, yesterday we were talking about research as well, and this is one of the things uh, that the strategic uh, plan talks about uh, in terms of consolidating and uh, translating scientific evidence and sharing experiences as well as um, lessons learned. And then finally, of course, raising awareness uh, with regard to social uh, mobilization. In addition, uh, the strategic plan identified a number of uh, uh, thematic areas that really needed attention. One related to drinking water and sanitation, air pollution, uh, marine and coastal pollution, uh, particularly uh, looking at uh, marine plastic litter, uh, sound management of chemicals, climate change, uh, urbanization, biodiversity, um, disasters, as well as uh, sustainable financing mechanism to make sure that we have the necessary finances to uh, support the implementation of the strategic uh, action plan. Thereafter, of course, there have been a number of uh, um, pronouncements, a number of decisions uh, from the United Nations Environment Assembly. Uh, in 2019, there was a resolution 4-21 uh, towards a pollution-free planet. Um, of course, in 2022, FAO, uh, World Organization for Animal Health, UNEP, WHO, uh, signed this MOU uh, to, you know, uh, move forward um, issues related to One Health. And then 2022, there was the UNEA resolution on ending plastic pollution. Uh, of course, towards developing an international legally binding instrument uh, to address the issue of plastic pollution. And this, of course, a number of meetings are already going on. And that's why I was bringing the issue of plastic pollution, because uh, in terms of the manufacture of plastics, 
um, or even discarding the plastic. Some of them, especially in rural areas, end up burning the plastic, and this really contributes uh, to emissions, which eventually, of course, climate change, and then, of course, uh, impacts on our human health. So this is one uh, uh, thing that the ministers of environment are really looking at uh, addressing. Um, I, want, I don't want to go into details here, but um, the, these are just some challenges that have been encountered along the way uh, in terms of looking at surveillance being conducted separately, you know, Minister of Health doing their thing and Minister of Environment doing their thing, and therefore uh, the need for collaboration so that uh, we have some integrated approach uh, to some of these uh, issues. In terms of uh, way forward, um, uh, of course there is need to continue uh, focusing on pri primary prevention, uh, continue advocacy, um, there's a need for decision makers from uh, various sectors, I said, uh, beyond health and environment to work together uh, to be able to come up with uh, solutions uh, towards uh, the challenge or interlinkages between uh, human health and environment. Um, of course, we need to continue with assessment of actions at country level um, um, and reported actions already as given examples given by Kenya Malawi demonstrate that joint health and environment actions can be an effective, uh, critical way of bringing uh, development sectors together. Um, there's a need to, uh, to build um, on what has already been achieved through the Libreville Declaration uh, towards the health, uh, and, um, uh, health and environment and contribute uh, to the well-being uh, of our populations. So in terms of conclusions and moving forward, uh, we are looking forward to the UNEP and WHO uh, uh, reestablishing the joint task team uh, that really was in support of member countries and working with up other partners uh, and member states and countries and other stakeholders, including the Chance Network here, uh, to be able to address uh, health environment and climate change um, challenges. Of course, within UNEP, we now have uh, a pollution and health program uh, that uh, would be uh, an entry point in terms of our support to countries uh, towards addressing the issues related to uh, environment, health, and climate change. So I'd like to stop there. There is a lot that we can talk about, but uh, due to time limits, uh, I would like to stop there, but I'll be available uh, for a few questions. Of course, we can also continue um, you know, keeping in touch beyond uh, this conference to see how we can uh, continuously work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. So as you can see from that presentation, all the high-level stuff is there. All that, everything we've been talking about, that there needs to be cooperation, there needs to be collaboration, that there needs to be funding set aside, that these are priority focal areas, all of that high-level stuff is there. But at the local level, for example, in my country, I know where there is a loss of air pollution and a loss of people are affected by air pollution, our National Department of Health is still delinked from the governance of air pollution because they find that that is the Environment Ministry's responsibility. They don't do health risk assessments. They don't quantify the deaths from air pollution. And because of that, National Department of Health doesn't take part in the policy discussion. It's not a health issue. Air pollution in South Africa is still largely an environment issue. And that's what this, this, this session is all about. It's about relinking health and environment. Um, Let's do what we did last time. Let's take five questions from the floor for David, and then we'll do some work um, around the table, thinking a little bit about the local level. So can I see a show of hands for five questions? Um, we'll take them together and give David a chance to respond, and then we'll do some group work. You must have questions. There's one. Can I see two? Uh, thank you very Two. much, David, for that uh, 
detailed presentation and it is encouraging to hear, like it has been observed, some of the questions that have been going around have answers at certain points, and that is the higher level. Um, I guess my question is in regard to documents related to the surveys that have been done, the strategies, where are they available from for, 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 for the sake of uh, those of us probably who are joining the movement at this time. You talked about the situation analysis, I think it was in Kenya, um, a collaborative environmental document that spells out what needs to be done, um, the research agenda, where are these documents available from? I guess that would be very helpful for some of us. Thank you. Thank you. At the back there, there's another question. And then we have uh, two online questions. And that will be the last question from one the online one online session. We have one more question. If anybody wants to raise their hand. Um, greetings. Um, I believe when you were setting the strategic plan, you had goals and objectives that were to be achieved according to a specific timeline. However, due to COVID, um, these goals and objectives may have not been accomplished at the specific time required. So my question is, how far back are we when it comes to the strategic plan? And what are we doing to account for the years and time lost during COVID? Thank you. Uh, let's take the online question. So the online question is from Sunanda Ray, and she's raising the question about how do we deal with buildings and especially new buildings um, and air conditioning as a way of um, maintaining cool, um, and how do we how do we negotiate that with uh, also reducing emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Africa, and so that is a question around buildings and air conditioning. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. I, I can really see a lot of work uh, going on by UNEP and then uh, as well as WHO um, aiming at one collective good. I just want to know if you really have uh, an in-country um, coordinating mechanism for the UN agencies and then uh, other relevant multinationals. I say this because it's, it's the same thing we feel in country as government institutions. So I, I would like to know some of the initiatives around there uh, between all those big uh, multinational and WHO and the rest and whether there have been successful examples and how this has translated to mentoring national governments to, uh, to, to kind of collaborate effectively. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Um, that, that was a very nice presentation. And I think my question is a follow-up to what I asked uh, Prof. Kanye before and what you just said, Rico. You know, we've got the infrastructure for collaboration. It's there. We've got the policy documentation. It's great. It's, you know, implementation is probably happening because you've invited a minister um, from this particular ministry. And that implementation at the local level is still not as efficient, right? What can we do to actually invest in systems more than that particular political figure who's going to be there for two years, voted out, and they are gone because they're a minister? What can we do as UN and WHO to build more in systems that work, systems that stay longer. I'm not saying people are not important, but you know, we've got to recognize that people have a certain time frame and then they come and go. Um, yeah, so that's to both of you. Um, do you wanna? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, David. All right, thanks. Uh, let me start with the last question in terms of, um, you know, we have uh, policies and everything, but of course, implementation is a challenge. 
Um, one of the focus uh, for the meeting of ministers of environment last week uh, was really how do we get uh, to even have the decisions that them ministers make to be implemented to the letter. And one of the things that um, we are doing uh, from the environment perspective, you will notice that most countries do have what we call the environment protection agencies or the national environment management authorities. These are institutions that, you know, are supposed to enforce the implementation of policies uh, laws, uh, different multilateral environmental agreements, and so forth. So what we have done now is that we have established a forum of environment protection agencies. So this forum brings together all environment protection agencies from all the African countries. And the idea is to have these uh, EPAs um, have a platform where they can exchange ideas, um, you know, exchange knowledge, learn from each other in terms of how they are doing the implementation or enforcing uh, issues within the different, um, uh, different countries. And basically from the UN side or UNEP side we'll be trying to see how we can support and strengthen these particular institutions so that they are able to play their role uh, within um, the countries. That's at the national level. So uh, that's what we are doing. Uh, obviously once that is done at the national level uh, we hope that that can then, you know, um, um, end up at the local level as well in terms of the enforcement and implementation. The second last uh, question was with regard to uh, in-country coordination mechanism. Um, there are a number of uh, um, uh, aspects under this. Uh, one is that, uh, and particularly with regard to the implementation of the Libreville Declaration, as I mentioned, uh, we had supported, uh, that's UNEP, WHO, uh, and other partners, had supported the creation of the country task teams. So these country task teams, of course, brought together different players, not only just limited to uh, ministries of environment and health, but other uh, relevant stakeholders to be part of this. So that was one. Um, and then, of course, within the UN mechanism, we have what we call the UN country teams. Uh, UNCTs, and these are led by the resident coordinator. So in every country, you will find there is a resident coordinator, a UN resident coordinator, and there is a UN country team. So all UN agencies that do have activities or programs or projects within the country also have to share this information within the UN country team. So this helps to understand or help everybody to know what, for example, UNEP is doing in a certain country, what WHO is doing, what UNDP is doing, what UNICEF is doing, uh, and so forth. So there is uh, the UN country teams uh, that uh, help with that. But related to that, of course, uh, all activities that, or interventions that the UN makes are, are more or less linked to the national um, government plans. Uh, you'll find that most of the governments do have uh, plans, uh, medium-term plans and so forth, ranging to th two, three, four, five years and so forth. So all the interventions that the uh, UN does within those countries are linked to the government uh, 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 medium-term plans. Um, there was a question with regard to buildings um, and safe buildings. Um, what I would say is that um, as of now, I think there is uh, a lot of technology now that is coming in, uh, in terms of ensuring that um, um, uh, uh, within the construction of buildings, uh, the materials, the technology that is used is really environmentally friendly. So this, of course, uh, is picking up, is taking traction. Obviously, within Africa, it might take a while before we are able to see this. But again, just as an example, if you go to a number of cities now, you will find that the approvals for constructions of building will not be granted unless there is, um, you know, uh, an inclusion of either solar uh, technology uh, for, 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 for power so that you're not only relying on the grid 
and also in terms of uh, even recycling of, or collection of water harvesting. So uh, in a number of cities now, they're enforcing that kind of uh, thing before they provide an approval for, for, for new buildings. Um, with regard to the strategic plan and uh, the time lost um, uh, during COVID, I would like to say actually COVID just uh, increased the urgency of taking action because it really just demonstrated that the link between human health and environment is real and particularly contact with um, um, uh, human wildlife which is quite important. But obviously, during that period, a lot of efforts and focus was really in supporting countries to deal with COVID and supporting countries to recover from COVID. Uh, but I believe now that most countries are stabilizing, and that's why um, I've been discussing with our colleagues from WHO and other partners to see how we can revitalize our collaboration and ensure the implementation of the strategic um, action plan. Um, with regard to the documents, in terms of the work that has been done over the years on the implementation of the Libreville Declaration, I think uh, uh, probably through the chance um, um, uh, organizers and network will be able to share the link where you can get all these documents in terms of all the work that has been done uh, by the different countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Do you all know who your WHO focal point in your country is? Do you know where he lives? Do you know where his office is? Okay, that's a good start. We have a, a, a quick intervention about another regional initiative before we uh, wrap up and do some housekeeping. Please. Th thank you very much, Rico, for giving me the opportunity. Good more afternoon, colleagues. How are you? Okay, thank you very much. I am Adelaide Onyango from the regional office Afro. I work with Brahma. So um, I wanted to share with you a piece of information that I think is very relevant to the discussion that's going on right now. And that is that um, on the request of the health ministers last year, they asked WHO to help to, to put together a strategy on multi-sectoral engagement to address our health challenges to, for the promotion of health and well-being in the African region. And next week, we're going to have the session, the 73rd session of the regional committee taking place right here in uh, Haveron. And uh, that is one of the strategies that we are presenting. And it is actually looking to really institutionalize impact analysis, not just health impact analysis, not just climate impact analysis, but we're also thinking about bringing on board the ideas that there is social impact analysis. There are many impact analysis that need to take place if we're going to recognize that what we do, and in fact, we, we, we need to start pulling health out of that and putting front well-being, because everybody can identify with trying to promote well-being. So health does that, environment teams do that, people in building, uh, uh, planning, everything, transport, they think they need to think about well-being. So we are going to be looking to revitalize all the engagements we have with the other UN sectors so that we come together to work with the different government ministries that we, we bring together, our line ministries in different areas, so that we really make this something that can change the way we do things and that I was asking uh, for, uh, I've asked the, uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Adunya to give me something on how do we do this? How do we, do, how do we make the vulnerability assessment something that actually takes on board the concerns from other sectors? I was talking to the uh, professor about how do we you take that transdisciplinarity into action and really bring it together. So we're really looking to try and make this work differently from what we've always done. So I wanted to share that news. Another thing that we're doing is a community engagement strategy. And that community engagement is also to say, we've been leaving the communities behind for too long. We think, oh, the sectors are going to come together and provide very smart answers to things. But if the community is not engaged, then we only achieve a small part of that. So just to say that we're trying our best. Fantastic.
Thank you very much. That is a very useful intervention. Um, and it kind of dovetails quite nicely into what I'm going to ask you to do over lunch and over the course of the day. Because we don't want to lose, we don't want to lose the learnings from the session. So I'm going to ask you two questions, and I want you to record those questions between now and the end of the day, and to feed back and give us your, um, your feedback to the Secretariat, to the Chance Secretariat before we leave. The first question is, can you provide an example of a successful intersectoral collaboration that you are working on? Can you give us a solid example of that? so that we can learn from that and record that. And also, having heard everything that you've heard in this session, what can you do at a personal level, at a professional level, to facilitate intersectoral collaboration at either national or local level in your country? So what can, what can you do at a personal level? And we'd like to record that so that we can think about how we can support that or how we can think about aggregating that information and building it into the capacity building needs that were expressed this morning. On the tables, there are some of these cards. If you want to record it on one of those cards, that's perfect. Or you can use the, uh, the, the Protea Hotel um, uh, paper. You can use that. And we'd, we'd really appreciate that. I see a hand. Quick question for clarity. If anybody has an inquiry for the WHO country office, there he is at the back. Please find him at lunchtime and you can... If, if there is anything outstanding, they can find you. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Before we close the session, um, I have an urgent appeal to all of you. There are people outside who are selling wonderful wares, wonderful souvenirs. Um, as a keepsake, you have a voucher. Please use that voucher. Do your little bit to support the people outside. They've been there for the last two days, and we want to be grateful for their efforts. And, and the very last thing is, if I have learned anything over the last five years, that is that people value their health. People are willing to make the biggest sacrifices they have ever made in order to protect their health. They have stayed away from work. They have lost their jobs. They have protected their families in the most unique ways. People value health. Health is a good pivot point for change. So let's think about how people understand Climate change will affect their health in the same way as they understood how COVID could potentially affect their health. And if people understand that in the same way, they will motivate for bigger and more ambitious action on climate change. So thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. And we'll see you in exactly one hour. Yep. Thank you, everybody.
na kwa shido na kaa sasa unaanza kumweka awe comfort hata kwa na ile We're living in a world that is getting hotter due to climate change. The last 10 years have been some of the hottest on record. Πλήττονται περισσότερο οι κλάδοι που εργάζονται σε περιβάλλοντα με πολύ ψηλές θερμοκρασίες, αλλά κυρίως οι εργαζόμενοι σε εξωτερικούς χώρους. Περίπου το 23% των εργαζομένων αυτή τη στιγμή, κατά το 1 τρίτο του χρόνου τους, εκτίθενται σε ψηλές θερμοκρασίες. If you have so many workers working in the heat, and these workers will be getting more and more because you have more parts of the world that are getting hotter, the more likely is that the kidney disease in these uh, regions will rise, then the healthcare system needs to sustain all these. It's a vicious cycle that we, we need to cut, we need to stop and address this problem right now. We know these are issues in the developing world, but it is time to take action here in Europe Temperatures in Europe are the highest that they have ever been. We have seen a record-breaking temperatures. In Spain, the death toll after the heat wave hitting the country rose to 360. In Portugal and Spain, officials say it has killed at least a thousand people so far. It's still not clear exactly when this heat wave will end. It opens the floodgates for that heat to surge up. Britain is bracing for record high temperatures. So is it down? To climate change. That's the big question. Climate scientists have been telling us for decades now. The toll of heat waves on human health is also expected to increase. Όταν ο εργαζόμενος του λέει υποσυνθήκες θερμικής καταπώνησης, αυξάνει η αστάθειά του. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να χτυπήσει. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να χειριστεί λάθος ένα εργαλείο χειρός. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να εμπλακεί σε ένα τροχαίο. Φαινόμενα τα οποία σίγουρα θα μπορούσαν να έχουν αποφευχθεί εάν υπήρχε η σχετική νομοθεσία και οι σχετικέ οδηγίε, ο μπούσουλα πάνω στον οποίο οι ειδικοί γιατροί εργασία θα δουλέψουν. Θεωρώ ότι η επιστήμη μπορεί να δώσει τη λύση σε τέτοια ζητήματα όπω είναι τη κλιματική αλλαγή και τη ανόδου τη θερμοκρασία. Θεωρώ ότι πρέπει να στρέψουμε την προσοχή μα στην επιστήμη και τα πορίσματα να τα κάνουμε δημόσια πολιτική. During the Heat Shield project, we created a number of small pilot-based applications that can use climate data to support workers, provide some initial advice. We also created a platform that provides guidance for workers depending on where they're working, uh, what type of job they're doing, and what uh, the weather is going to be on the next days. Τον 45. Δουλειά μου είναι σε οικονομικέ εργασίε, συγκεκριμένα σε τοποθετήσει πλακιδίων. Όταν πρώτο ξεκίνησα πριν 20 χρόνια, 25 σχεδόν, δεν θυμάμαι να είχαμε τόσο ψηλέ θερμοκρασίε. Όταν ξέρουμε ότι θα έχει πάρα πολύ ζέστη, προσπαθούμε να ξεκινήσουμε όσο πιο γρήγορα γίνεται, δηλαδή πρωινέ ώρε.
Αυτό που μπορούμε να κάνουμε είναι να κάνουμε περισσότερα διαλύματα, γιατί κάποια στιγμή δεν αντέχεις. Fame Lab, what we've managed to do in the heat shield project is start initially with lab-based work and then go to the field, get a lot more data in real settings, in reality, and then see whether our simulations at the lab apply to the field, use the lab data to answer some of the questions we couldn't answer in the field and vice versa. Greece, in the heart of the country, the furthest away you can be from water, right in the center of Greece, a large valley, and it gets really hot and humid in the summer, and there's a lot of agriculture here. As a consumer, we go to the supermarket, we buy organic products. Obviously, we prefer those because we know that they are, they are grown more naturally, but we forget that to grow such crops there is a lot more manual labor involved compared to conventional agriculture. Για μας είναι φιλοσοφία ζωής ο τρόπος καλλιέργειας. Η καλλιέργειά μας είναι αγροοικολογική γιατί μας ενδιαφέρει να δώσουμε ό,τι καλύτερο μπορούμε στους καταναλωτές και μας ενδιαφέρει η ποιότητα των προϊόντων μας. Υπάρχει προστασία για το περιβάλλον και προστασία για τον άνθρωπο. Είναι τα principles που έχει ουσιαστικά αυτός ο τρόπος καλλιέργειας, οπότε είναι αυτό που μας καλύπτει. Σίγουρα δεν είμαστε σαν μια συμβατική φάρμα. Η εργασία μας είναι σε εξωτερικό χώρο με αρκετή ηλιοφάνεια στον τόπο μας. Η μόνη λύση για να προστατευτούμε εκτός από το να φοράμε κατάλληλα ρούχα είναι να ξεκινήσουμε πάρα πολύ νωρίς την εργασία μας και να κάνουμε ένα διάλειμμα το μεσημέρι και να συνεχίσουμε αργότερα το απόγευμα. Today we see barn bull everywhere in Greece, in our homes, in hotels. To see this and, and feel and walk on this uh, wonderful product, often people don't realize the amount of work needed to extract it, to process it, and to apply it in a way that uh, people can enjoy it. Η εξόρυξη και η επεξεργασία του μαρμάρου συμβάλλει στο εθνικό αγαθάριστο προϊόν της χώρας. Η εργασία στο λατομείο έχει το μειονέκτημα ότι ο εργαζόμενος εκτίθεται σε ακραίες καιρικέ συνθήκες. Το χειμώνα παλεύεται το νερό, η ζέστη δεν παλεύεται. Κόλαση. In 2017 to now, we've noticed that it is every summer very, very hot and uh, non-stop heat waves. Last year, it was the first time that the Acropolis had 55 degrees Celsius. The sun is much more aggressive to the skin. It's nothing like it used to be 10 years back. The skin is burned. Every tour, both for guests and tourist guides, it's a matter of survival. 
And in 2019, it was we were pouring water on our guests just to survive the tour. We had a colleague that she collapsed on the Acropolis and she broke her arm. Uh, many colleagues, including me, I collapsed three times in 2019. I've seen tourists having strokes as well. When you have people over 80, for example, that they are not hydrated properly, they are not dressed properly, and they are exposed in the heat for a long time, it can happen. We should stop this thing of mass tourism without having any control of it. You cannot have 10,000, 15,000 people coming all at the same time to visit the Acropolis. The government, the cruise line should agree on appointments so people can have limited time that they are exposed in the heat. If the sites would be open seven to let's say one and then open again at six to nine, I would think that is the only solution. Στους Δήμους τρέχουν αυτή την περίοδο προγράμματα που απασχολούν για αρκετούς μήνες ανθρώπου που έχουν μεγαλύτερες ηλικίε. Η ικανότητα προσαρμογής στη θερμοκρασία αυτών των ατόμων είναι μειωμένη. Και επειδή είναι ήδη προχωρημένης ηλικία σε σχέση με τα εργασιακά, τα χρόνια νοσήματα έχουν ήδη εμφανιστεί. Ο ζαχαρόδης διαβήτης, τα καρδιαγγειακά, τα αναπνευστικά. Προσλαμβάνουμε ανθρώπου 55-60 χρόνων να εργαστούν, του βγάζουμε να καθαρίσουν του δρόμου και δεν έχουμε ακόμα. Επαρκή προμήθεια σε ατομικά μέσα προστασία. Έχουμε καπέλα. Πολλέ φορέ όχι. Μπορεί πολλέ φορέ να ολοκληρωθεί ο διαγωνισμό για την προμήθεια των ατομικών απαραίτητων μέσων προστασία για τη θερμική καταπώνηση όταν θα έχει πια λήξει η σύμβαση του εργαζόμενου. Άρα σε αυτό θα πρέπει να γίνουμε πιο γρήγοροι, πιο ευέλικτοι, πιο αποτελεσματικοί. Και καμία εργασία επικίνδυνη να μην επιτρέπεται αν δεν τηρούνται και δεν έχουν εξασφαλιστεί από πριν όλα τα απαραίτητα μέτρα ώστε να μην κινδυνεύσει η ανθρώπινη υγεία. Σε κάθε περίπτωση, η κακή εφαρμογή των πολιτικών πρόληψης, θερμικής προσαρμογής και αντιμετώπισης θερμικής καταπόλυσης αυξάνει κατακόρυφα τον κίνδυνο επαγγελματικών ατυχημάτων. Τα μέτρα που εφαρμόζονται μέχρι σήμερα στηρίζονται στι γενικέ νομοθετικέ προβλέψει για την προστασία των εργαζομένων σε σχέση με την υγεία και την ασφαλεία του. Όμω, καθώ το πρόβλημα εντείνεται, γίνεται όλο και πιο ορατό ότι χρειαζόμαστε εξειδικευμένα μέτρα, ειδικά για το θέμα αυτό. Και σε αυτό το τομέα θα πρέπει να κινηθεί και η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση συνολικά και τα κράτη-μέλη. Αν δεν καταλάβουμε ότι η κλιματική αλλαγή είναι εδώ και είναι για να μείνει, αν δεν προσαρμόσουμε την νοοτροπία μα, τον τρόπο σκέψη μα και την ομοθεσία μα στα νέα δεδομένα. Το αποτέλεσμα θα είναι οι άνθρωποι να αρρωσταίνουν πολύ περισσότερο. Θα έχουμε αύξηση τη νοσηρότητα. Θα έχουμε αύξηση των θανάτων. Και σίγουρα θα έχουμε μια κατακόρυφη αύξηση των εργατικών ατυχημάτων. that is getting hotter due to climate change. The last 10 years have been some of the hottest on record. Πλήττονται περισσότερο οι κλάδοι οποίοι εργάζονται σε περιβάλλοντα με πολύ ψηλές θερμοκρασίες, αλλά κυρίως οι εργαζόμενοι σε εξωτερικούς χώρους. Περίπου το 23% των εργαζομένων αυτή τη στιγμή, κατά το 1 τρίτο του χρόνου τους, εκτίθενται σε ψηλές θερμοκρασίες. If you have so many workers working in the heat, and these workers will be getting more and more because you have more parts of the world that are getting hotter, 
the more likely is that the kidney disease in these uh, regions will rise, then the healthcare system needs to sustain all these. It's a vicious cycle that we, we need to cut, we need to stop and address this problem right now. We know these are issues in the developing world, but it is time to take action here in Europe. Temperatures in Europe are the highest that they have ever been. We have seen a record breaking temperatures. In Spain, the death toll after the heat wave hitting the country rose to 360. In Portugal and Spain, officials say it has killed at least a thousand people so far. It's still not clear exactly when this heat wave will end. It opens the floodgates for that heat to surge up. Britain is bracing for record high temperatures. So is it down? to climate change? That's the big question. Climate scientists have been telling us for decades now. The toll of heat waves on human health is also expected to increase. When the workers work, the conditions of the economic development increase the astathia. It's much more difficult to hit. It's much more difficult to hit a mistake of a mistake. It's much more difficult to hit a mistake. Φαινόμενα τα οποία σίγουρα θα μπορούσαν να έχουν αποφευχθεί εάν υπήρχε η σχετική νομοθεσία και οι σχετικέ οδηγίε, ο μπούσουλα πάνω στον οποίο οι ειδικοί γιατροί εργασία θα δουλέψουν. Θεωρώ ότι η επιστήμη μπορεί να δώσει τη λύση σε τέτοια ζητήματα όπω είναι τη κλιματική αλλαγή και τη ανόδου τη θερμοκρασία. Θεωρώ ότι πρέπει να στρέψουμε την προσοχή μα στην επιστήμη και τα πορίσματα να τα κάνουμε δημόσια πολιτική. During the Heat Shield project, we created a number of small pilot-based applications that can use climate data to support workers, provide some initial advice. We also created a platform that provides guidance for workers depending on where they're working, uh, what type of job they're doing, and what the, the weather is going to be on the next days. Είμαι ετών 45. Δουλειά μου είναι οικονομικέ εργασίε, συγκεκριμένα σε τοποθετήσει πλακιδίων. Όταν πρώτο ξεκίνησα πριν 20 χρόνια, 25 σχεδόν, δεν θυμάμαι να είχαμε τόσο ψηλέ θερμοκρασίε. Όταν ξέρουμε ότι θα έχει πάρα πολύ ζέστη, προσπαθούμε να ξεκινήσουμε όσο πιο γρήγορα γίνεται, δηλαδή πρωινέ ώρε. Αυτό που μπορούμε να κάνουμε είναι να κάνουμε περισσότερα διαλύματα γιατί κάποια στιγμή δεν αντέχεις. At the Fame Lab, what we've managed to do in the Heat Shield project is start initially with lab-based work and then go to the field, get a lot more data in real settings, in reality, and then see whether our simulations at the lab apply to the field, use the lab data to answer some of the questions we couldn't answer in the field, and vice versa. We're in Greece, in the heart of the country, the furthest away you can be from water, right in the center of Greece, a large valley, and it gets really hot and humid in the summer and there's a lot of agriculture here. As a consumer, we go to the supermarket, we buy organic products. Obviously, we prefer those because we know that they're, they're grown more naturally, but we forget that to grow such crops, there's a lot more manual labor involved compared to conventional agriculture. Είναι φιλοσοφία ζωή ο τρόπο καλλιέργεια. Η καλλιέργειά μα είναι αγροοικολογική γιατί μα ενδιαφέρει να δώσουμε ό,τι καλύτερο μπορούμε στου καταναλωτέ και μα ενδιαφέρει η ποιότητα των προϊόντων μα. Υπάρχει προστασία για το περιβάλλον και προστασία για τον άνθρωπο. 
είναι τα principles που έχει ουσιαστικά αυτός ο τρόπος καλλιέργειας, οπότε είναι αυτό που μας καλύπτει. Σίγουρα δεν είμαστε σαν μια συμβατική φάρμα. Επειδή η εργασία μας είναι σε εξωτερικό χώρο, με αρκετή ηλιοφάνεια στον τόπο μας, η μόνη λύση για να προστατευτούμε εκτός από το να φοράμε κατάλληλα ρούχα είναι να ξεκινήσουμε πάρα πολύ νωρίς την εργασία μας, να κάνουμε ένα διάλειμμα το μεσημέρι και να συνεχίσουμε αργότερα το απόγευμα. Today we see Barnable everywhere in Greece, in our homes, in hotels. To see this and, and feel and walk on this uh, wonderful product, often people don't realize the amount of work needed to extract it, to process it, and to apply it in a way that uh, people can enjoy it. Η εξόρυξη και η επεξεργασία του μαρμάρου συμβάλλει στο εθνικό αγαθάριστο προϊόν της χώρας. Η εργασία στο λατομείο έχει το μειονέκτημα ότι ο εργαζόμενος εκτίθεται σε ακραίες καιρικές συνθήκες. Το χειμώνα παλεύεται το νερό, η ζέστη δεν παλεύεται, κόλαση. From 2017 to now, we've noticed that it is every summer very, very hot and uh, non-stop heat waves. Last year, it was the first time that the Acropolis had 55 degrees Celsius. The sun is much more aggressive to the skin. It's nothing like it used to be 10 years back. The skin is burned. Every tour, both for guests and tourist guides, it's a matter of survival. And in 2019, it was we were pouring water on our guests just to survive the tour. We had a colleague that she collapsed on the Acropolis and she broke her arm. Uh, many colleagues, including me, I collapsed three times in 2019. I've seen tourists having strokes as well. When you have people over 80, for example, that they are not hydrated properly, they are not dressed properly, and they are exposed in the heat for a long time, it can happen. We should stop this thing of mass tourism without having any control of it. You cannot have 10,000, 15,000 people coming all at the same time to visit the Acropolis. The government, the, the cruise line should agree on appointments so people can have limited time that they are exposed in the heat. If the sites would be open 7 to, let's say, 1 and then open again at 6 to 9, I would think that is the only solution. Στους Δήμους, Τρέχουν αυτή την περίοδο προγράμματα που απασχολούν για αρκετού μήνε ανθρώπου που έχουν μεγαλύτερε ηλικίε. Η ικανότητα προσαρμογή στη θερμοκρασία αυτών των ατόμων είναι μειωμένη. Και επειδή είναι ήδη προχωρημένη ηλικία σε σχέση με τα εργασιακά, τα χρόνια νοσήματα έχουν ήδη εμφανιστεί. Ο ζαχαρόδη διαβήτη, τα καρδιαγγειακά, τα αναπνευστικά. Προσλαμβάνουμε ανθρώπου 55-60 χρονών να εργαστούν, του βγάζουμε να καθαρίσουν του δρόμου και δεν έχουμε ακόμα. Επαρκή προμήθεια σε ατομικά μέσα προστασία. Έχουμε καπέλα. Πολλέ φορέ όχι. Μπορεί πολλέ φορέ 
να ολοκληρωθεί ο διαγωνισμό για την προμήθεια των ατομικών απαραίτητων μέσων προστασία για τη θερμική καταπώνηση, όταν θα έχει πια λήξει η σύμβαση του εργαζόμενου. Άρα σε αυτό θα πρέπει να γίνουμε πιο γρήγοροι, πιο ευέλικτοι, πιο αποτελεσματικοί. Και καμία εργασία επικίνδυνη να μην επιτρέπεται αν δεν τηρούνται και δεν έχουν εξασφαλιστεί από πριν όλα τα απαραίτητα μέτρα ώστε να μην κινδυνεύσει η ανθρώπινη υγεία. Σε κάθε περίπτωση, η κακή εφαρμογή των πολιτικών πρόληψη θερμική προσαρμογή και αντιμετώπιση θερμική καταπώνηση αυξάνει κατακόρυφα τον κίνδυνο επαγγελματικών ατυχημάτων. Τα μέτρα που εφαρμόζονται μέχρι σήμερα στηρίζονται στι γενικέ νομοθετικέ προβλέψει για την προστασία των εργαζομένων σε σχέση με την υγεία και την ασφάλειά του. Όμω, καθώ το πρόβλημα εντείνεται, γίνεται όλο και πιο ορατό ότι χρειαζόμαστε εξειδικευμένα μέτρα, ειδικά για το θέμα αυτό. Και σε αυτό το τομέα θα πρέπει να κινηθεί και η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση συνολικά και τα κράτη-μέλη. Αν δεν καταλάβουμε ότι η κλιματική αλλαγή είναι εδώ και είναι για να μείνει, αν δεν προσαρμόσουμε την οτροπία μα, τον τρόπο σκέψη μα και την ομοθεσία μα στα νέα δεδομένα. Το αποτέλεσμα θα είναι οι άνθρωποι να αρρωσταίνουν πολύ περισσότερο. Θα έχουμε αύξηση τη νοσηρότητα. Θα έχουμε αύξηση των θανάτων. Και σίγουρα θα έχουμε μια κατακόρυφη αύξηση των εργατικών ατυχημάτων. Living in a world that is getting hotter due to climate change, the last 10 years have been some of the hottest on record. Πλήττονται περισσότερο οι κλάδοι οι οποίοι εργάζονται σε περιβάλλοντα με πολύ ψηλές θερμοκρασίες, αλλά κυρίως οι εργαζόμενοι σε εξωτερικούς χώρους. Περίπου το 23% των εργαζομένων αυτή τη στιγμή, κατά το 1 τρίτο του χρόνου τους, εκτίθενται σε ψηλές θερμοκρασίες. If you have so many workers working in the heat, and these workers will be getting more and more because you have more parts of the world that are getting hotter, the more likely is that the kidney disease in these uh, regions will rise, then the healthcare system needs to sustain all these. It's a vicious cycle that we, we need to cut, we need to stop and address this problem right now. We know these are issues in the developing world, but it is time to take action here in Europe. Temperatures in Europe are the highest that they have ever been. We have seen record-breaking temperatures. In Spain, in Defto, after the heat wave hitting the country, it rose to 360. In Portugal and Spain, officials say it has killed at least a thousand people so far. It's still not clear exactly when this heat wave will end. It opens the floodgates for that heat to surge up. Britain is bracing for record high temperatures. So is it down? To climate change. That's the big question. Climate scientists have been telling us for decades now. The toll of heat waves on human health is also expected to increase. Όταν ο εργαζόμενος του λέει υποσυνθήκες θερμικής καταπώνησης, αυξάνει η αστάθειά του. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να χτυπήσει. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να χειριστεί λάθος ένα εργαλείο χειρός. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να εμπλακεί σε ένα τροχαίο. Φαινόμενα τα οποία σίγουρα θα μπορούσαν να έχουν αποφευχθεί εάν υπήρχε η σχετική νομοθεσία και οι σχετικέ οδηγίε, ο μπούσουλα πάνω στον οποίο οι ειδικοί γιατροί εργασία θα δουλέψουν. Θεωρώ ότι η επιστήμη μπορεί να δώσει τη λύση σε τέτοια ζητήματα όπω είναι τη κλιματική αλλαγή και τη ανώδου τη θερμοκρασία. Θεωρώ ότι πρέπει να στρέψουμε την προσοχή μα στην επιστήμη και τα πορίσματα να τα κάνουμε δημόσια πολιτική. During the Heat Shield project, we created a number of small pilot-based applications that can use climate data to support workers, provide some initial advice, 
We also created a platform that provides guidance for workers depending on where they're working, uh, what type of job they're doing, and what uh, the weather is going to be on the next days. Είμαι τον 45. Δουλειά μου είναι οικονομικές εργασίες, συγκεκριμένα σε τοποθετήσεις πλακιδίων. Όταν πρώτο ξεκίνησα πριν 20 χρόνια, 25 σχεδόν, δεν θυμάμαι να είχαμε τόσο ψηλές θερμοκρασίες. Όταν ξέρουμε ότι θα έχει πάρα πολύ ζέστη, προσπαθούμε να ξεκινήσουμε όσο πιο γρήγορα γίνεται, δηλαδή πρωινέ ώρες. Αυτό που μπορούμε να κάνουμε είναι να κάνουμε περισσότερα διαλύματα γιατί κάποια στιγμή δεν αντέχεις. At the Fame Lab what we've managed to do in the heat shield project is start initially with lab based work and then go to the field, get a lot more data in real settings, in reality and then see whether our simulations at the lab apply to the field, use the lab data to answer some of the questions we couldn't answer in the field, and vice versa. We are in Greece, in the heart of the country, the furthest away you can be from water, right in the center of Greece, a large valley, and it gets really hot and humid in the summer and there's a lot of agriculture here. As a consumer, we go to the supermarket, we buy organic products. Obviously, we prefer those because we know that they are, they are grown more naturally, but we forget that to grow such crops, there's a lot more manual labor involved compared to conventional agriculture. Είναι φιλοσοφία ζωή ο τρόπο καλλιέργεια. Η καλλιέργειά μα είναι αγροοικολογική γιατί μα ενδιαφέρει να δώσουμε ό,τι καλύτερο μπορούμε στου καταναλωτέ και μα ενδιαφέρει η ποιότητα των προϊόντων μα. Υπάρχει προστασία για το περιβάλλον και προστασία για τον άνθρωπο. Είναι τα principles που έχει ουσιαστικά αυτό ο τρόπο καλλιέργεια. Οπότε. Είναι αυτό που μας καλύπτει. Σίγουρα δεν είμαστε σαν μια συμβατική φάρμα. Επειδή η εργασία μας είναι σε εξωτερικό χώρο, με αρκετή ηλιοφάνεια στον τόπο μας, η μόνη λύση για να προστατευτούμε εκτός από το να φοράμε κατάλληλα ρούχα είναι να ξεκινήσουμε πάρα πολύ νωρίς την εργασία μας, να κάνουμε ένα διάλειμμα το μεσημέρι, και να συνεχίσουμε αργότερα το απόγευμα. Today we see barnable everywhere in Greece, in our homes, in hotels. To see this and feel and walk on this wonderful product, often people don't realize the amount of work needed to extract it, to process it, and to apply it in a way that people can enjoy it. Η όρυξη και η επεξεργασία του μαρμάρου συμβάλλει στο εθνικό αγαθάριστο προϊόν της χώρας. Η εργασία στο λατομείο έχει το μειονέκτημα ότι ο εργαζόμενος εκτίθεται σε ακραίες καιρικές συνθήκες. Το χειμώνα παλεύεται το νερό, η ζέστη δεν παλεύεται. Κόλαση.
2017 to now, we've noticed that it is every summer very, very hot and uh, non-stop heat waves. Last year, it was the first time that the Acropolis had 55 degrees Celsius. The sun is much more aggressive to the skin. It's nothing like it used to be 10 years back. The skin is burned. Every tour, both for guests and tourist guides, it's a matter of survival. And in 2019, it was, we were pouring water on our guests just to survive the tour. We had a colleague that she collapsed on the Acropolis and she broke her arm. Uh, many colleagues, including me, I collapsed three times in 2019. I've seen tourists having strokes as well. When you have people over 80, for example, that they are not hydrated properly, they are not dressed properly, and they are exposed in the heat for a long time, it can happen. We should stop this thing of mass tourism without having any control of it. You cannot have 10,000, 15,000 people coming all at the same time to visit the Acropolis. The government, the cruise line should agree on appointments so people can have limited time that they are exposed in the heat. If the sites would be open seven to, let's say, one, and then open again at six to nine, I would think that is the only solution. Στους Δήμους τρέχουν αυτή την περίοδο προγράμματα που απασχολούν για αρκετούς μήνες ανθρώπους που έχουν μεγαλύτερες ηλικίε. Η ικανότητα προσαρμογής στη θερμοκρασία αυτών των ατόμων είναι μειωμένη. Και επειδή είναι ήδη προχωρημένης ηλικία σε σχέση με τα εργασιακά, τα χρόνια νοσήματα έχουν ήδη εμφανιστεί. Ο ζαχαρόδης διαβήτης, τα καρδιαγγειακά, τα αναπνευστικά. Προσλαμβάνουμε ανθρώπους 55-60 χρόνων να εργαστούν, τους βγάζουμε να καθαρίσουν τους δρόμους και δεν έχουμε ακόμα επαρκή προμήθεια σε ατομικά μέσα προστασίας. Έχουμε καπέλα. Πολλές φορές όχι. Μπορεί πολλές φορές να ολοκληρωθεί ο διαγωνισμός για την προμήθεια των ατομικών απαραίτητων μέσων προστασίας για τη θερμική καταπώνηση όταν θα έχει πια λήξη σύμβαση του εργαζόμενου. Άρα σε αυτό θα πρέπει να γίνουμε πιο γρήγοροι, πιο ευέλικτοι, πιο αποτελεσματικοί. Και καμία εργασία επικίνδυνη να μην επιτρέπεται αν δεν τηρούνται και δεν έχουν εξασφαλιστεί από πριν όλα τα απαραίτητα μέτρα ώστε να μην κινδυνεύσει η ανθρώπινη υγεία. Σε κάθε περίπτωση η κακή εφαρμογή των πολιτικών πρόληψης, θερμικής προσαρμογής και αντιμετώπισης θερμικής καταπόνησης αυξάνει κατακόρυφα τον κίνδυνο επαγγελματικών ατυχημάτων. Τα μέτρα που εφαρμόζονται μέχρι σήμερα στηρίζονται στι γενικέ νομοθετικέ προβλέψει για την προστασία των εργαζομένων σε σχέση με την υγεία και την ασφάλειά του. Όμω, καθώ το πρόβλημα εντείνεται, γίνεται όλο και πιο ορατό ότι χρειαζόμαστε εξειδικευμένα μέτρα, ειδικά για το θέμα αυτό. Και σε αυτό το τομέα θα πρέπει να κινηθεί και η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση συνολικά και τα κράτη-μέλη. Αν δεν καταλάβουμε ότι η κλιματική αλλαγή είναι εδώ και είναι για να μείνει. Αν δεν προσαρμόσουμε την νοοτροπία μα, τον τρόπο σκέψη μα και την νομοθεσία μα στα νέα δεδομένα. Το αποτέλεσμα θα είναι οι άνθρωποι να αρρωσταίνουν πολύ περισσότερο. Θα έχουμε αύξηση τη νοσηρότητα. Θα έχουμε αύξηση των θανάτων. Και σίγουρα θα έχουμε μια κατακόρυφη αύξηση των εργατικών ατυχημάτων. that is getting hotter due to climate change. The last 10 years have been some of the hottest on record.
πλήττονται περισσότερο οι κλάδοι οι οποίοι εργάζονται σε περιβάλλοντα με πολύ ψηλέ θερμοκρασίε, αλλά κυρίω οι εργαζόμενοι σε εξωτερικού χώρου. Περίπου το 23% των εργαζομένων αυτή τη στιγμή, κατά το 1 τρίτο του χρόνου του, εκτίθενται σε υψηλέ θερμοκρασίε. If you have so many workers working in the heat, and these workers will be getting more and more because you have more parts of the world that are getting hotter, the more likely is that the kidney disease in these uh, regions will rise. Then the healthcare system needs to sustain all these. It's a vicious cycle that we, we need to cut, we need to stop and address this problem right now. We know these are issues in the developing world, but it is time to take action here in Europe. Temperatures in Europe are the highest that they have ever been. We have seen record-breaking temperatures. In Spain, the death toll after the heat wave hitting the country rose to 360. In Portugal and Spain, officials say it has killed at least a thousand people so far. It's still not clear exactly when this heat wave will end. It opens the floodgates for that heat to surge up. Britain is bracing for record high temperatures. So is it down? To climate change. That's the big question. Climate scientists have been telling us for decades now. The toll of heat waves on human health is also expected to increase. Όταν ο εργαζόμενος του λέει υπό συνθήκες θερμικής καταπώνησης, αυξάνει η αστάθειά του. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να χτυπήσει. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να χειριστεί λάθος ένα εργαλείο χειρός. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να εμπλακεί σε ένα τροχαίο. Φαινόμενα τα οποία σίγουρα θα μπορούσαν να έχουν αποφευχθεί εάν υπήρχε η σχετική νομοθεσία και οι σχετικέ οδηγίε, ο μπούσουλα πάνω στον οποίο οι ειδικοί γιατροί εργασία θα δουλέψουν. Θεωρώ ότι η επιστήμη μπορεί να δώσει τη λύση σε τέτοια ζητήματα όπω είναι τη κλιματική αλλαγή και τη ανόδου τη θερμοκρασία. Θεωρώ ότι πρέπει να στρέψουμε την προσοχή μα στην επιστήμη και τα πορίσματα να τα κάνουμε δημόσια πολιτική. During the Heat Shield project, we created a number of small pilot-based applications that can use climate data to support workers, provide some initial advice. We also created a platform that provides guidance for workers depending on where they're working, uh, what type of job they're doing, and what the, the weather is going to be on the next days. Είμαι ετών 45. Δουλειά μου είναι οικονομικέ εργασίε, συγκεκριμένα σε τοποθετήσει πλακιδίων. Όταν πρώτο ξεκίνησα πριν 20 χρόνια, 25 σχεδόν, δεν θυμάμαι να είχαμε τόσο ψηλέ θερμοκρασίε. Όταν ξέρουμε ότι θα έχει πάρα πολύ ζέστη, προσπαθούμε να ξεκινήσουμε όσο πιο γρήγορα γίνεται, δηλαδή πρωινέ ώρε. Αυτό που μπορούμε να κάνουμε είναι να κάνουμε περισσότερα διαλύματα γιατί κάποια στιγμή δεν αντέχεις. At the Fame Lab, what we've managed to do in the Heat Shield project is start initially with lab-based work and then go to the field, get a lot more data in real settings, in reality, and then see whether our simulations at the lab apply to the field, use the lab data to answer some of the questions we couldn't answer in the field, and vice versa. We're in Greece, in the heart of the country, the furthest away you can be from water, right in the center of Greece, a large valley, and it gets really hot and humid in the summer and there's a lot of agriculture here. As a consumer, we go to the supermarket, we buy organic products. Obviously, we prefer those because we know that they are... The exorics and the exorics of Marmaru are in the ethnic area of the country.
Η εργασία στο λατομείο έχει το μειονέκτημα ότι ο εργαζόμενος εκτίθεται σε ακραίες καιρικές συνθήκες. Το χειμώνα παλεύεται το νερό, η ζέστη δεν παλεύεται. Κόλαση. In 2017 to now, we've noticed that it is every summer very, very hot and uh, non-stop heat waves. Last year, it was the first time that the Acropolis had 55 degrees Celsius. The sun is much more aggressive to the skin. It's nothing like it used to be 10 years back. The skin is burned. Every tour, both for guests and tourist guides, it's a matter of survival. And in 2019, it was we were pouring water on our guests just to survive the tour. We had a colleague that she collapsed on the Acropolis and she broke her arm. Uh, many colleagues, including me, I collapsed three times in 2019. I've seen tourists having strokes as well. When you have people over 80, for example, that they are not hydrated properly, they are not dressed properly, and they are exposed in the heat for a long time, it can happen. We should stop this thing of mass tourism without having any control of it. You cannot have 10,000, 15,000 people coming all at the same time to visit the Acropolis. The government, the cruise line should agree on appointments so people can have limited time that they are exposed in the heat. If the sites would be open 7 to, let's say, 1 and then open again at 6 to 9, I would think that is the only solution. Στους Δήμους τρέχουν αυτή την περίοδο προγράμματα που απασχολούν για αρκετούς μήνες ανθρώπους που έχουν μεγαλύτερες ηλικίε. Η ικανότητα προσαρμογής στη θερμοκρασία αυτών των ατόμων είναι μειωμένη. Και επειδή είναι ήδη προχωρημένης ηλικία σε σχέση με τα εργασιακά, τα χρόνια νοσήματα έχουν ήδη εμφανιστεί. Ο ζαχαρόδης διαβήτης, τα καρδιαγγειακά, τα αναπνευστικά. Προσλαμβάνουμε ανθρώπους 55-60 χρόνων να εργαστούν, τους βγάζουμε να καθαρίσουν τους δρόμους και δεν έχουμε ακόμα επαρκή προμήθεια σε ατομικά μέσα προστασίας. Έχουμε καπέλα. Πολλές φορές όχι. Μπορεί πολλές φορές να ολοκληρωθεί ο διαγωνισμός για την προμήθεια των ατομικών απαραίτητων μέσων προστασίας για τη θερμική καταπώνηση όταν θα έχει πια λήξη σύμβαση του εργαζόμενου. Άρα σε αυτό θα πρέπει να γίνουμε πιο γρήγοροι, πιο ευέλικτοι, πιο αποτελεσματικοί. Και καμία εργασία επικίνδυνη να μην επιτρέπεται αν δεν τηρούνται και δεν έχουν εξασφαλιστεί από πριν όλα τα απαραίτητα μέτρα ώστε να μην κινδυνεύσει η ανθρώπινη υγεία. Σε κάθε περίπτωση η κακή εφαρμογή των πολιτικών πρόληψη, θερμική προσαρμογή και αντιμετώπιση θερμική καταπώνηση αυξάνει κατακόρυφα τον κίνδυνο επαγγελματικών ατυχημάτων. Τα μέτρα που εφαρμόζονται μέχρι σήμερα στηρίζονται στι γενικέ νομοθετικέ προβλέψει για την προστασία των εργαζομένων σε σχέση με την υγεία και την ασφάλειά του. Όμω, καθώ το πρόβλημα εντείνεται, γίνεται όλο και πιο ορατό ότι χρειαζόμαστε εξειδικευμένα μέτρα, ειδικά για το θέμα αυτό. Και σε αυτό το τομέα θα πρέπει να κινηθεί και η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση συνολικά και τα κράτη-μέλη. Αν δεν καταλάβουμε ότι η κλιματική αλλαγή είναι εδώ και είναι για να μείνει, αν δεν προσαρμόσουμε την νοοτροπία μα, τον τρόπο σκέψη μα και την νομοθεσία μα στα νέα δεδομένα, το αποτέλεσμα θα είναι οι άνθρωποι να αρρωσταίνουν πολύ περισσότερο. Θα έχουμε αύξηση τη νοσηρότητα. Θα έχουμε αύξηση των θανάτων και σίγουρα θα έχουμε μια κατακόρυφη αύξηση των εργατικών ατυχημάτων.
We're living in a world that is getting hotter due to climate change. The last 10 years have been some of the hottest on record. Πλήττονται περισσότερο οι κλάδοι οι οποίοι εργάζονται σε περιβάλλοντα με πολύ ψηλές θερμοκρασίες, αλλά κυρίως οι εργαζόμενοι σε εξωτερικούς χώρους. Περίπου το 23% των εργαζομένων αυτή τη στιγμή, κατά το 1 τρίτο του χρόνου τους, εκτίθενται σε ψηλές θερμοκρασίες. If you have so many workers working in the heat, and these workers will be getting more and more because you have more parts of the world that are getting hotter, the more likely is that the kidney disease in these uh, regions will rise, then the healthcare system needs to sustain all these. It's a vicious cycle that we, we need to cut, we need to stop and address this problem right now. We know these are issues in the developing world, but it is time to take action here in Europe. Temperatures in Europe are the highest that they have ever been. We have seen record-breaking temperatures. In Spain, the death toll after the heat wave hitting the country rose to 360. In Portugal and Spain, officials say it has killed at least a thousand people so far. It's still not clear exactly when this heat wave will end. It opens the floodgates for that heat to surge up. Britain is bracing for record high temperatures. So is it down? to climate change. That's the big question. Climate scientists have been telling us for decades now. The toll of heat waves on human health is also expected to increase. Όταν ο εργαζόμενος δουλεύει υπό συνθήκες θερμικής καταπώνησης, αυξάνει η αστάθειά του. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να χτυπήσει. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να χειριστεί λάθος ένα εργαλείο χειρός. Είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να εμπλακεί σε ένα τροχαίο. Φαινόμενα τα οποία σίγουρα θα μπορούσαν να έχουν αποφευχθεί εάν υπήρχε η σχετική νομοθεσία και οι σχετικέ οδηγίε, ο μπούσουλα πάνω στον οποίο οι ειδικοί γιατροί εργασία θα δουλέψουν. Θεωρώ ότι η επιστήμη μπορεί να δώσει τη λύση σε τέτοια ζητήματα όπω είναι τη κλιματική αλλαγή και τη ανόδου τη θερμοκρασία. Θεωρώ ότι πρέπει να στρέψουμε την προσοχή μα στην επιστήμη και τα πορίσματα να τα κάνουμε δημόσια πολιτική. During the Heat Shield project, we created a number of small pilot-based applications that can use climate data to support workers, provide some initial advice. We also created a platform that provides guidance for workers depending on where they're working, uh, what type of job they're doing, and what the, the weather is going to be on the next days. Είμαι ετών 45. Δουλειά μου είναι οικονομικέ εργασίε, συγκεκριμένα σε τοποθετήσει πλακιδίων. Όταν πρώτο ξεκίνησα πριν 20 χρόνια, 25 σχεδόν, δεν θυμάμαι να είχαμε τόσο ψηλέ θερμοκρασίε. Όταν ξέρουμε ότι θα έχει πάρα πολύ ζέστη, προσπαθούμε να ξεκινήσουμε όσο πιο γρήγορα γίνεται, δηλαδή πρωινέ ώρε. Αυτό που μπορούμε να κάνουμε είναι να κάνουμε περισσότερα διαλύματα γιατί κάποια στιγμή δεν αντέχεις. At the Fame Lab, what we've managed to do in the Heat Shield project is start initially with lab-based work and then go to the field, get a lot more data in real settings, in reality, and then see whether our simulations at the lab apply to the field, use the lab data to answer some of the questions we couldn't answer in the field, and vice versa. We're in Greece, in the heart of the country, the furthest away you can be from water, right in the center of Greece, a large valley, and it gets really hot and humid in the summer and there's a lot of agriculture here. As a consumer, we go to the supermarket, we buy organic products. Obviously, we prefer those because we know that they're, they're grown more naturally, but we forget that to grow such crops, 
there is a lot more manual labor involved compared to conventional agriculture. Μας είναι φιλοσοφία ζωής ο τρόπος καλλιέργειας. Η καλλιέργειά μας είναι αγροοικολογική γιατί μας ενδιαφέρει να δώσουμε ό,τι καλύτερο μπορούμε στους καταναλωτές και μας ενδιαφέρει η ποιότητα των προϊόντων μας. Υπάρχει προστασία για το περιβάλλον και προστασία για τον άνθρωπο. Είναι τα principles που έχει ουσιαστικά αυτός ο τρόπος καλλιέργειας, οπότε είναι αυτό που μας καλύπτει. Σίγουρα δεν είμαστε σαν μια συμβατική φάρμα. Επειδή η εργασία μας είναι σε εξωτερικό χώρο, με αρκετή ηλιοφάνεια στον τόπο μας, η μόνη λύση για να προστατευτούμε εκτός από το να φοράμε κατάλληλα ρούχα είναι να ξεκινήσουμε πάρα πολύ νωρί την εργασία μας, να κάνουμε ένα διάλειμμα το μεσημέρι και να συνεχίσουμε αργότερα το απόγευμα. Today we see marble everywhere in Greece, in our homes, in hotels. To see this and feel and walk on this wonderful product, often people don't realize the amount of work needed to extract it, to process it, and to apply it in a way that people can enjoy it. Η εξόρυξη και η επεξεργασία του μαρμάρου συμβάλλει στο εθνικό αγαθάριστο προϊόν της χώρας. Η εργασία στο λατομείο έχει το μειονέκτημα ότι ο εργαζόμενος εκτίθεται σε ακραίες καιρικές συνθήκες. Το χειμώνα παλεύεται το νερό, η ζέστη δεν παλεύεται, κόλαση. From 2017 to now, we've noticed that it is every summer very, very hot and uh, non-stop heat waves. Last year, it was the first time that the Acropolis had 55 degrees Celsius. The sun is much more aggressive to the skin. It's nothing like it used to be 10 years back. The skin is burned. Every tour, both for guests and tourist guides, it's a matter of survival. And in 2019, it was we were pouring water on our guests just to survive the tour. We had a colleague that she collapsed on the Acropolis and she broke her arm. Uh, many colleagues, including me, I collapsed three times in 2019. I've seen tourists having strokes as well. When you have people over 80, for example, that they are not hydrated properly, they are not dressed properly, and they are exposed in the heat for a long time, it can happen. We should stop this thing of mass tourism without having any control of it. You cannot have 10,000, 15,000 people coming all at the same time to visit the Acropolis. The government, the, the cruise line should agree on appointments so people can have limited time that they are exposed in the heat. If the sites would be open 7 to, let's say, 1 and then open again at 6 to 9, I would think that is the only solution.
στους Δήμους τρέχουν αυτή την περίοδο προγράμματα που απασχολούν για αρκετούς μήνες ανθρώπους που έχουν μεγαλύτερε ηλικίε. Η ικανότητα προσαρμογής στη θερμοκρασία αυτών των ατόμων είναι μειωμένη και επειδή είναι ήδη προχωρημένη ηλικία σε σχέση με τα εργασιακά, τα χρόνια νοσήματα έχουν ήδη εμφανιστεί. Ο ζαχαρόδης διαβήτης, τα καρδιαγγειακά, τα αναπνευστικά. Προσλαμβάνουμε ανθρώπους 55-60 χρονών να εργαστούν, τους βγάζουμε να καθαρίσουν τους δρόμους και δεν έχουμε ακόμα επαρκή προμήθεια σε ατομικά μέσα προστασία. Έχουμε καπέλα. Πολλές φορές όχι. Μπορεί πολλές φορές να ολοκληρωθεί ο διαγωνισμό για την προμήθεια των ατομικών απαραίτητο μέσο προστασία για τη θερμική καταπώνηση όταν θα έχει πια λήξει η σύμβαση του εργαζόμενου. Άρα σε αυτό θα πρέπει να γίνουμε πιο γρήγοροι, πιο ευέλικτοι, πιο αποτελεσματικοί. Και καμία εργασία επικίνδυνη να μην επιτρέπεται αν δεν τηρούνται και δεν έχουν εξασφαλιστεί από πριν όλα τα απαραίτητα μέτρα ώστε να μην κινδυνεύσει η ανθρώπινη υγεία. Σε κάθε περίπτωση η κακή εφαρμογή των πολιτικών πρόληψη θερμικής προσαρμογής και αντιμετώπισης θερμικής καταπόνησης αυξάνει κατακόρυφα τον κίνδυνο επαγγελματικών ατυχημάτων. Τα μέτρα που εφαρμόζονται μέχρι σήμερα στηρίζονται στι γενικέ νομοθετικέ προβλέψει για την προστασία των εργαζομένων σε σχέση με την υγεία και την ασφάλειά του. Όμω, καθώ το πρόβλημα εντείνεται, γίνεται όλο και πιο ορατό ότι χρειαζόμαστε εξειδικευμένα μέτρα, ειδικά για το θέμα αυτό. Και σε αυτό το τομέα θα πρέπει να κινηθεί και η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση συνολικά και τα κράτη-μέλη. Αν δεν καταλάβουμε ότι η κλιματική αλλαγή είναι εδώ και είναι για να μείνει, αν δεν προσαρμόσουμε την οτροπία μα, τον τρόπο σκέψη μα και την ομοθεσία μα στα νέα δεδομένα. Το αποτέλεσμα θα είναι οι άνθρωποι να αρρωσταίνουν πολύ περισσότερο. Θα έχουμε αύξηση τη νοσηρότητα. Θα έχουμε αύξηση των θανάτων. Και σίγουρα θα έχουμε μια κατακόρυφη αύξηση των εργατικών ατυχημάτων.
can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. okay. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Welcome back in the room after lunch. And welcome to this session on future directions in climate and health. I'm Gunnar Sandanger. I work at CICERO, Center for International Research in Oslo, in Norway. Uh, and I work in the communications department. And um, in this, I'm very happy to lead this session, where we will get different perspectives on future directions in climate and health from three different experts. Not, not very much. Online with us, we have Pablo Suarez, who is Associate Director of Programs for Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. And in the panel here with us, we have Mr. Rudolf Abugnaba Abanga from the University of Development Studies in Ghana and Health Systems Global. And Ms. Aziza Wangunwala, Medical Scientist and Africa Regional Coordinator for Global Green Healthy Hospitals Programs in the NGO Groundwork, which is based in South Africa. And towards the end of the session, we will make sure there, are, there is some time for questions, both from online participants and you in the audience here. The first presentation is by Pablo Suarez, and he will talk about climate change and mental health. I hope he will come up on our screen. Hello, friends. Can you hear me? Uh, I know he is, I am present. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Gunnell. Thank you, dear friends. And very much looking forward to learning from you and contributing to this session. Here we are. Excellent. Greetings. My name is Pablo, Pablo Suarez. I am originally from Argentina. And uh, two decades and a half ago, I became a researcher on climate, disasters, and decision. And my, most of my work at the time was in uh, Matabele land, which is, what, 500 kilometers from the border with Botswana. Uh, so after having worked a lot in Southern Africa, I'm really happy to be with you, uh, even if from the distance. I'm joining you from Boston. It's early morning. And uh, I am accompanied by my trusty companion, Ippolito, here, who is proving how much uh, attention can be given to things or not. Uh, I hope you have a fruitful day. And let me jump straight into um, why I am uh, trying to share some thoughts with you. Let's first do screen sharing when everything can fail. Good. Looks like you can see my screen. If we're going to be talking about the future of climate change and health in Africa, we need to include in the conversation how we're going to understand, anticipate, and address mental health. Like in my home country of Argentina, mental health across the African continent is often treated as a taboo, as a stigma, as something that we do not talk about. Now, if you are informed and if you are sensitive, you know, as in the map uh, from Africa, from IPCC, that things are on a trajectory to get very, very bad, very, very dangerous. And our minds are trying to process this information. There are all, th all kinds of things that scientists can tell of what happens in the brain. Now, see this. This is a map of temperature anomalies and a a meteorologist identified a pattern that looked like the scream, a famous painting uh, from uh, a time when the sky was so bloody red because of a, an, an atmospheric anomaly that this painter felt like screaming. And that's how many of us researchers, humanitarian workers, young activists, farmers who cannot feed their children, it feels like screaming. And the mental health trajectory for the planet and for Africa are very, very concerning. Uh, it may look like a normal day, but it's only a true statement if you accept that what we now call normal is extremely unstable. 
extremely capable of going a little bit out of balance and then collapsing, whether it's because of natural phenomena, uh, climate impacting the way people live and, and nurture their livelihoods, or because of relationships between people, systems, and so on. Now, to dive deeper, I'm going to do something uh, new to me that I hope uh, will work for you since there's an element of communication here. How are we going to communicate things that are difficult to absorb because of the taboo nature of mental health? I've been working with neuroscientists and with professional artists to create new forms of communication. So here comes a pop-up book like children's books on climate and mental health. So we know that mental health care systems facilities are generally not accessible around the world and especially in Africa. In a changing climate, we have much more darkness and this darkness is an additional impediment for the mental health and well-being of our populations. How are we going to improve what we need? Now, as mentioned before, it may have felt like screaming sometimes in the past. Whoops, there we go. Can I do this correctly? But now it feels like even more screaming because a climate that is changing in a geopolitical context where things are not good. If you look at data, data in Africa on mental health is extremely scarce. This is one of many portrayals of data about mental health from elsewhere. And this one shows, let me see if I can put it down for a moment and uh, uh, join downwards. This joins from 1980 to 2020, how did suicide rank as a cause of death for different age groups from uh, infants all the way to uh, older adults? And it turns out that uh, suicide is ranked second for uh, people ages 15 to 24. And incredibly, as you can see in a little blob here, uh, right there, that, that little black dot, suicide now is in the top 10. It ranks 10th for children ages five to nine in the United States. Suicide ranks 10th as a cause of death for children five to nine. That's in a place with data. I don't think that Africa is there, certainly not yet, but we need to ask ourselves questions and come up with ideas. How much do we understand, anticipate, and address the things that are going on? Can we notice what is coming to Africa, given how little we know about too many of the things that affect us? So my last slide with a little bit of a sense of what to expect. Uh, we know that there are many connections between climate and mental health. Very obviously, if there is scarcity, if there is malnutrition, the brain of children will not develop properly, and there's much more uh, chance, much more probability of mental health conditions as they grow. Of course, this is very important for so much of Africa that is so dependent on rain-fed agriculture. When things go wrong, there's despair, there's hopelessness, there's grief. That affects how much people are willing to embark in the active doing of what needs to be done. Disasters, shocks of any kind, tropical cyclones, unprecedented floods or heat waves or disease outbreaks, they create distress, trauma, depression, and more, which again makes it harder to enact the kind of ambitious change we need. Droughts have been shown to lead to increased rates of suicide, all the way from uh, commercial wealthy farmers in Australia to subsistence farmers in India. I do not know details of how things are going in Africa. I know that there's very little data, but it's something to pay attention to. 
how can we help address the mental health dimensions of parents who confront travel or of children who can't do well. Heat waves have a demonstrable link to violence, violence. including van gun violence. And unfortunately, there are more guns causing trouble in the continent. Pre-existing conditions augment the risk. For example, big heat wave here in North America, people with schizophrenia died at triple the rate of the normal population. What do we know in Africa about people as the population is aging, people with Alzheimer's and dementia, are they, are they going, going to be ready, ready to respond to an early warning system? There are so many gaps in knowledge, action, advocacy, and more, that given what you're doing in this chance event, I was hoping that mental health could be part of what is talked about. I'm going to stop now because I understand that uh, things started a little bit late. So, so thanks, thanks again, again for the opportunity, opportunity and I remain in the session for the later portions. Over to you. Can I get a point? Uh, but with serious gaps in data, knowledge, and action, as you said. Our next speaker is Rudolf Abugnaba Abanga, who will give us a presentation on the topic Health Systems Research for Climate Adaptation. Please go ahead, Rudolf. Yes, um, before we get the uh, presentation done, I will pick up from the last session. I think that one of the missed opportunities we've had in the last five decades, it's our refusal or our difficulty in branding climate change as a health issue. I think it's purely a health issue. Ask me why. Most people who want to be healthy, live a long life, and most people will visit our health facilities. And for those who will not visit our health facilities, they use plants and traditional medicine. So climate change resonates very well and should be branded as a health issue. Now, with regards to research, in Ghana, when we say um, the future is pregnant, it means that uh, there are a lot of things that are unknown or are yet to be known. So I'll try as much as possible to uh, do this in the Ghanaian context, but I'm hoping that uh, it will resonate well with a lot of Africa. This thing is not working. OK, next slide. Next slide, please. Maybe just put it off and you can, I'll say next, then you continue, yeah. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, so I want to start, I usually will start with uh, these pictures and then um, the whole of today I have heard people say that, well, um, we, we have to prioritize. Uh, there's no money. But I honestly think that uh, climate resilient and sustainable health systems, it's directly proportional. Go back, go back to the beginning. Please go back. Yeah, second slide, yeah. It, it's, we can say directly proportional to uh, uh, universal health coverage. Ask me why. We, we, Yes, and I'll tell you why. Because we have seen examples in Pakistan. You can continue to pretend to manage. I don't have money, so let me give people basic health care with infrastructure and everything. I think it's last year in South Africa, there was so much flood and everything went into the drain. Now in Pakistan, we saw last year, all the infrastructure is gone. So you can invest to 95% achieving UHC, 
one day you're going to lose that to zero. So the two are synonymous, and we can do without that. Now you can see the pictures here. This is a medical doctor drowned, and that it's a corona ward that got flooded. So it tells you that we need to take this very important. Next slide. Now this is me. I was going to pick my data. <coughs> and I, it was in the morning, and then uh, I got there. Uh, the most important thing is that the clinic, it's at the last end of the village. So I saw so many houses. In fact, I saw a school in the center of the village. But unfortunately, the clinic was at the last end, so I couldn't cross. So I said to myself, well, if there was a pregnant woman here, what would have happened? So that is the sad story. People do still get an intersectoral collaboration, like I've been saying, it's very important. And then again, I did an analysis, a vulnerability and capacity assessment on uh, floods, storms, heat waves, wildfires, droughts in 60 primary healthcare facilities. This is the average. 80% of our health facilities at the primary healthcare in Ghana, at least in the northern part of Ghana, are not prepared at all for climate change. So that is for us to look. Next slide. Now, again, I try to look at, um, if you are conversant with uh, vulnerability assessment, there's this thing we call the uh, WHO checklist for um, assessing the vulnerability of healthcare facilities. And it focuses on the component of workforce, wash and healthcare waste, energy, infrastructure. And then I can tell you that overall, no facility by type, whereas the big one in the district, or is the health center, or is the community-based one, as we call it, CHIPS, it's prepared. You can have people that are moderately prepared, or health facilities that are moderately prepared, but we do not have facilities prepared in northern Ghana, and I'm sure it's the same story for the whole of Africa. So what I can tell you is that when I said the future is pregnant, there's so much to do in health workforce that is linked to mental health, like the first speaker said, because you already know that if your colleague dies after a flood, after returning from work, what is going to happen to you? You're going to start thinking. You are going to get depressed, and then you're going to suffer. So there's so much work to do on the wash, energy, infrastructure, and then um, so it's pregnant, like I said. Move on to the next slide. Yes, and then uh, this is the irony of it. I tried to show you this picture. Um, this, an NGO put up a wash facility in a clinic. Now, after one win, this is the maternity ward of the clinic. Poor intersectoral collaboration. You have a new wash facility, the, the maternity uh, uh, room or delivery room of the clinic, it's leaking during rain. What's going to happen? So we've come back to zero. We haven't achieved what we want to achieve. So poor intersectoral collaboration is one of the things that we need to look at. Next slide. Now, we try to do something about PHC system readiness, and what we use, what we call the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research Index. It's very simple. We try to look at the perception of uh, managers, perception of programs within the Ghana Health Services, perception of the system and community. And then you notice that everything here, from two to zero, it's a facilitator, and from zero to minus one, it's a barrier. You notice that uh, everything it's a facilitator apart from perception of systems and communities. So let's move to the next slide where I break on there. And then you can see external policy. Here when I say external policy and incentives, it's nothing more than for the PhD programs, policy at the national level. Because the health systems is an institution of policies, and then it's very important that you must integrate climate resilience into policies, guidelines, to be able to get them implementing this. Next slide. Yes, and then as you can see, these are other barriers. Cost has been coming, top-down approaches, very important. People don't like top-down approaches. They think it's complex. Poor community entry, it's one of the barriers that comes out. And then I think that the issue of transdisciplinary research comes here. And then there are workforce constraints and community participation pop up as uh, serious challenges to mainstreaming. Can we move on? Now, I would like to conclude by um, touching on uh, a number of issues. It's pregnant, like I told you, but at least we can look at this. 
Policy issues are very important. And for me, I advocate what we call treatment screening or systems approaches because the health, systems, the health system is a heavily regulated institution. And without policies around climate resilience, not standalone processes, integrated policies that are integrated into their programs, integrated into their health management information systems, and then integrating accountability mechanisms, you are not going to get them to take it seriously at all. And we need to make an investment case, like I said, it's very important for policymakers. For the health workforce, there are issues of capacity, workloads, and integration. As much as uh, the health workforce, it's there, it forms a basis, but there's too much workload on them. And then again, we need to look at the resilience actions around maternal, newborn, the agent, and then adolescent. These are very vulnerable group of people. So we need to see how the health systems can respond to these people. And we can explore technology for health, ICT, and other innovations. And then, most important thing, multi-sectoral collaboration. Not only in the capital cities, but at the local level. I tell you, I've seen a health facility, beautiful one, built. In the rainy city, nobody can go there. Because the community gave out land that was in a flooded area, because the land was supposed to be for free. So I think that, finally, the untap area is nature-based solutions, which we, we need to look at. I think it can solve most of the problems that uh, we are dealing with health systems. So I think I would end here. I hope I didn't overrun my 10 minutes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rudolf. Yeah. It's my mic on. Next slide. Yes, so we will have time to explore a little bit more in the Q&A. Next speaker is Aziza Rangunbala on integrating mitigation and adaptation in greener hospitals. Please go ahead. Uh, after lunch shift. <laughs> um, yeah, so while we wait for my slides to come up, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, it's really great two days that we've been interacting, having very important conversations around climate resilience, adaptation, um, and also like Rudolf mentioned, uh, mental health, which is very important to considering that the climate crisis is a health crisis. And we only think about physical health when we think about health. But it's also important to look at mental health. So I'm going to be talking about integrating mitigation and adaptation strategies in greener hospitals. Um, and for context, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about a program that I coordinate. Oh, next, next slide. Please go next. Um, so the program is called Global Green Healthy Hospitals. But just because it says hospitals, it doesn't mean it's only hospitals. Um, it's a network of health care facilities, health systems, health organizations all around the world working together to create a, um, a healthier and more sustainable planet and also a very transformative healthcare system. So members within the network um, use innovation, ingenuity, and investment to transform the healthcare sector. And these members use their own resources, what they currently have, to work on certain sustainability issues. So I'm the coordinator for the African continent, and um, I believe that healing happens outside of the healthcare system. Healing happens, healing happens in leadership, political determinants of health. But when we talk about leadership in the network, we're talking about hospitals taking leadership in climate and health issues. And this is a lot of capacity building involved in that leadership where we have trained the trainer, where one person trains the rest of the people at healthcare facility level. Now we heard a lot about how top-down approaches have limitations, and we are trying to, to close that gap by also working from the ground upwards. Um, so the goals within the um, Global Green Healthy Hospitals Network, as you can see, would be chemicals, safer chemicals, waste, energy, water, transportation, food, pharmaceuticals, because, by the way, pharmaceuticals find their way into our drinking water, and because filtration systems, they don't use nanofiltration or reverse osmosis all the time. So even in first world countries, you know, you find traces of pharmaceuticals in the drinking water. Um, buildings and also purchasing. And buildings are important for adaptation, not just for mitigation. And purchasing is about sustainable procurement. Health has big buying power. And it's very important that health um, utilizes that power. Can you go back to my slide, please? Okay, they are gone. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I'm going to <coughs> highlight a few of these. Um, you can go, these are directly linked to the sustainable development goals, uh, good health and well-being, climate action, and indirectly linked to actually much, many more. Next. So just a little bit more info. We provide guidance documents as resources for members, um, self-assessments, baseline assessments. There's a checkup tool. Um, we're also working on a guide for climate change and health for health professionals. Um, Klamelo in the audience is actually contracted to do that work, and she's based here in Botswana. Um, and looking at your greenhouse gas emissions as well. So I'm going to highlight just a few actual case studies of what hospitals are doing. Um, next. So um, hospitals, energy, poverty is a determinant of health. So when we're looking at climate change adaptation in Africa, we really have to look at an energy, and not just clean energy for mitigation, but also access to energy, because a hospital or health system cannot run without energy. So we had an oncology hospital in Egypt, one of our members that had high operating costs um, and negative environmental effects. Now in Egypt, 90% of the electricity comes from fossil fuels. But they actually managed to reduce their carbon emissions, like 261.5 tons of the CO2 equivalent in less than a year. You can see it's October until March this year, less than a year. And they didn't go renewable, or they didn't use a lot of money, they didn't spend a lot of money. They used timers, they retrofit to LED light bulbs from fluorescent to LEDs, small, 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 small differences using the resources they had. Now we also have other members in South Africa that obviously because of load shedding went through renewable energy like rooftop solar, our private hospital systems because they have money. Um, and then also wind energy, because Cape Town is a nice and windy city, and Kailisha hospitals use both solar and wind. And as much as this sounds like mitigation, guess what? Air quality. You're protecting the patients before they come to the hospital. Because health, doesn't, health is not the absence of illness. We're also sitting here, it's about health, what we eat, the air we breathe, the lighting, the effects on our headaches, migraines. Um, you can go next. So the next one is water. So we are current, we are always facing water shortages. In 2016, there was an intense drought in South Africa. So in 2018, one of the clinics in Cape Town decided we need to make a plan because water. Thank you. Um, so they looked at the rainwater harvesting that you can, you know, get your um, one kiloliter of water from 4.1 millimeters of rainfall. So you actually get a lot of water out from your rainfall seasons. But that's when there is rainfall season. So this is an adaptation measure for when there is rainfall. And um, so District 6 Clinic actually uses, they, they have, it, it, there's 21% of the facility's total water because water scarcity is also a big thing. In, in Africa, as a continent, there's millions of people that do not have access to safe, clean drinking water, never mind the health system. Next. And then the other one that's interesting is healthcare risk waste. Rudolph, you had that as well as one of your indicators. Now, healthcare risk waste is visible, but people think it's invisible. Once you throw something away into the garbage, we don't know where, where are all these water bottles going, guys? It's invisible, right? It's visible but invisible. It's going somewhere. It's killing someone. More than, more than one someone, actually. It's killing the whole ocean. So healthcare risk waste is a major cost driver for healthcare facilities. So it costs a lot of money. It is a hazard. Hazardous landfill sites where kids play with syringes is a reality. We've seen photos of kids playing with syringes. Now, you rely on your service providers for transport, to treat, dispose of your waste. And service interruptions leads to what? Patients, visitors, and the animals in the hospital, because we have, some hospitals have monkeys in South Africa, and then they play around with the hazardous waste. And several hospitals have installed on-site treatment technology, moving away from long transportation routes and moving away from incineration. Incineration can never, ever, ever be eco-friendly. We cannot afford to incinerate these things. It ends up in our soil, in our water, and it ends up 
in land, you know, that whole cycle of the waste. So safer chemicals is also an occupational health and safety measure. Um, down here, you, it's not going to be clear for you, but basically the volume of waste is reduced significantly by 70%. So you don't need big trucks hauling waste around. I mean, sometimes waste travels more than people travel, and that's a bit unfair. Next. And then the other one is food. Now, food is an interesting one because a lot of hospitals, this is one hospital, Polosong Hospital, that started this food garden, and they harvest cabbage, tomatoes, spinach, and several hospitals have also started food gardens. Now, the food garden is an interesting one because there were lots of service delivery interruptions during COVID where food was not delivered to hospitals. One of the hospitals that grew maize ended up using that maize to at least give the diabetic patients because the sugar was dropping and they needed to give the diabetics something. And I mean, healthcare workers can't use their own money to feed 300 patients in a hospital. So these food gardens, they also use the produce to give to outpatients who come to fetch their um, medication, the ARVs, because HIV-positive patients take a lot of medication, and you can't take medication on an empty stomach. You need to eat something, so there's, they, they get something to take with home, so they can at least eat to take their medication. Um, and I mean, this is obviously about the reliance of supply chain and how we're mitigating these effects. and. Um, I've just outlined the basic few, because we know that climate change is a health threat, but it's also an opportunity to redefine the social and environmental determinants of health, you know, and so we can look at how can we improve the health system. And adaptation me measures are very important for health equity. Now, preparing your health workforce is important, and this type of thing creates that awareness of these are environmental health practitioners, they are not gardeners. They didn't study agriculture, they, don't, they only now learned how to do gardens at home, so they taught themselves. And they made sure that they got the resources. So we have to look at how we can act on greenhouse gas reductions, but also reduce the adverse effects of climate change. Because there are clearly gaps in action. We have all the policies, but now it's time to do something. You know, we need to work from the bottom up. So, um, next slide. Just in conclusion, um, I'm also involved in research on climate resilience for healthcare systems in Mozambique, um, Zambia, and South Africa with regards to extreme weather events. I mean, we don't want to see patients that have to be relocated somewhere else. In Neisner, in the Western Cape in South Africa, there were wildfires. Patients had to be moved from one hospital to another hospital. So those are patients in a parking lot waiting to go to another hospital. And they had to be fetched in tranches. So we're looking at adaptation measures with mitigation synergies, but also mitigation measures with adaptation synergies. And looking at things like clean air, safe water, and food are the low-hanging fruit and also the basics. So we need to consider that as much as the climate crisis is threatening an already overburdened healthcare system, facing severe resource constraints, how do we get the health people at the health system working, not just the politicians? So, like I said, everything else will be chaos if the basics are not covered. And one of the speakers also mentioned about top-down having limits. There we go. This is from the ground up. So adaptation is about risk management, and we need to be proactive, not reactive. And lastly, just some good news. G20 countries, South Africa is part of the G20, they made climate and health a priority issue at the highest level because they recognize that climate change is gonna drive health emergencies. So they're committing to actually mobilizing resources for low carbon resilient health systems. Thank you. One question for Pablo. Can, uh, is it possible to get Pablo on screen? Anyways, I will ask the question. And while you think about your, the next questions you want to ask. Uh, Pablo, your team is uh, known for innovative approaches for learning and dialogue. So could you tell us a little bit about the work on mental health and climate you have through unconventional partnerships? And we can, we can gather some questions if you want while we wait for Pablo. Ah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, thanks. 
cube. So I used to be a full-time researcher on climate and disasters. And when bringing science to decision makers, whether it was the parliament of Uganda or subsistence fishermen in Mozambique, I was very good at putting people to sleep because science can be confusing, science can be distancing. So we started working creatively with creative partners from musicians and dancers and uh, artists to people who know how to embody risk. Now I'm happy to report that for mental health, we are now doing unusual, very effective things with two kinds of collaborators. One is professional humorists. You already saw some of the work in my earlier presentation. This is a cartoon about how we are juggling with too much and sometimes we cannot keep up. How we treat our mental health as something that needs to be suppressed and invisible to others. How we lack data from the global south, especially Africa, on mental health issues. How timing is so important. If you're a little bit late, you may be too late and catastrophic consequences may happen. And on this one, I want to highlight that in addition to humorists, we have been working with professional aerial acrobats from Africa, from Brazil, and from Australia. Look at this. This is from a global conference on disasters uh, held by World Bank in Brazil. And we had a performance where we could hear what was going on inside the head of the acrobats as they were delivering an amazing performance about risks, risk management, mental preparedness. What are we going to do knowing that the things coming our way are very dangerous? I know that this takes uh, experimentation. We're very, very grateful to the Welcome Policy Lab, the Welcome Trust, for supporting this work. Uh, Bettina, who is present with you in Botswana, can tell you more about some of the things we have done and we are doing. You don't need to be a flyer or a trapeze artist. We could do simple activities involving juggling, for example, to help us understand how when a little bit of something goes a little bit wrong, there can be cascading effects, including on the mental health side of changing climate. There's much more that we could share, but I'll stop here. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Pablo. So we will go on to the audience. There is a question in back there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my question is to Rudolf. One of the um, recurring themes that keeps coming up is this problem of poor intersectoral collaboration. What are the interventions that work, Rudolf, that we can actually adopt and take forward? That's number one. The second question also to you, um, some of the barriers that you talked to, including your workforce, the complexity of the health system, um, the poor community entry issues. These are the issues that we hear an awful lot, even outside of climate change related topics. Um, I, my question again is, what should we do? What are the interventions that you can suggest? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are running a little bit short of time, so we will gather the questions. I will have one online question, Celeste. We have that. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Can I can I go ahead with my question? Is that all right? Uh, yeah, okay. The short question. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Very very short. Um, thank you so much uh, to the presenters. Very interesting, and thank you to Chance for actually putting together this conference. So um, I want to just touch on the element of mental health um, and. Uh, you know, it's been said that it is, it is a crisis, it's an emergency. And um, a lot of the times, especially in Africa, it's something that we have not uh, directed enough resources towards, um, Botswana being one of those countries. So I'm thinking that um, in the context of countries where there's opportunity, because I mean, Botswana right now, we have a mental health bill that is before parliament, and I think it's an absolutely amazing opportunity to start addressing, um, like you said, um, understanding, anticipating, addressing um, issues of mental health, um, not only related to climate change, but generally within the country. Um, my question then becomes, how do you then, um, where mental health is not a priority in countries, how do you then drive the conversation of mental health and climate change? So that's my first question. My second question is with regards to um, facilities and facility preparedness. And I'm just thinking about South Africa um, and the Office of Health Standard Compliance that basically is tasked with looking at hospitals and clinics and health posts and anything that's similar, 
and whether um, they are compliant with certain elements. And I'm wondering if something similar can't be created um, for climate change, um, to look at hospitals and look at certain elements and see, are you compliant, are you ready um, to actually address issues of climate change? Thank and you. And then um, one more comment. Um, um, Thank you. We need and, to proceed. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Can you answer the questions shortly? And we... Yeah, I, let me have to back up. Mm. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Um, at every level, um, there is supposed to be some kind of uh, collaboration. If you look at the example I give you, um, you, you have a clinic uh, that the government requires that land should be donated by the community. The community doesn't hold or doesn't own the whole land. Somebody owns it. And the fellow decides to say that, okay, I'm going to give you, once it's for free, I'm going to give you the land that I don't need. You go to put up a health facility there. During the dry season, it's good. During the rainy season, absolutely nobody can go there. So what I'm trying to say is that you, you need to be able to work with all the stakeholders with climate change in mind. A very honest work with them to be able to get this done. Now, it also linked to the issues of capacity. I have spoken to a lot of health facilities, um, managers, and they believe that climate change only interferes with their processes. They cannot go to work because it has rained. Capacity is lacking, even within the health leaders, to be able to extend their fear of influence. Now, the primary drivers of development is the local government. They haven't got the commitment. They just want to see clinics being put out. So what I am saying is that you need to talk to everyone that matters. Leave no one behind in your consultation when it comes to climate change and health. And then um, regulation and preparedness, I think that uh, uh, it's very true. We, we need to appreciate that uh, climate change has come to stay. It's affecting our way of life. If we already have building codes, why can't we kind of uh, up these building codes, especially for public institutions, to take into consideration climate proofing and then uh, green elements like uh, Aziza has said. I think that it's, it's a beginning, something that we can begin to look at as a country and it will work out well. Aziza, would you like to add? Yeah, um, I think um, you've covered most of your um, questions. Maybe I can just comment on the mental health as aspect that we actually need to realize that most hospitals in the public health care system don't really have mental health services and it's not accessible. And also looking at digital and telehealth, I think it's a good future in when we're trying to climate proof our health systems. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So I think maybe the online presenters can use the Q&A function and we can have the panel go and answer them. Um, Thank you so much for this session, for very interesting presentations. And uh, we will now move on to the next session, which is on networks and partnerships, with Julian Natukunda as chair. Uh, we yeah. Our yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And while the next speakers are going to be kitted out with a microphone, or maybe just have the handheld microphone. If you are a speaker, please come this way. For everyone else, can I please invite you to do a small little exercise on networking and how it is important sometimes to lead and sometimes to follow. And I'm looking for a volunteer. Anyone who quickly can volunteer. How about uh, Dida Cruz? Could you be my volunteer here for a second? Fellow geographer, yes. No? Oh, fellow geographer, thank you. So this is the task for you all to do. It's very challenging because space is very narrow, but you'll find a way, I'm sure. So Dida, because you look at the palm of my hand here. Just look at mine, you can relax your arm. And you try and have the same distance between you and my palm of the hand and the same angle. So if I go like this, you move. You move that way. Yes. Okay, let's switch around. You do your hand. 
and I'll follow your palm of your hand. Move. If you move, okay. You see, it can be challenging, and you can move forward and backwards. The distance should be the same. You get the concept? Please choose a partner. If you have someone on your left that is a very good friend and someone on your right that you don't know, please choose the one on the right. Yes? Can you stand up, please, and choose a partner? If you feel you don't want to participate, you're welcome to be an observer. But it's less fun. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Do you have a partner? All right, ready. One is leading, the other one is following. And off you go. Make sure your partner is safe. All right. Just now, please stop. And now, the one who was following is now leading. The one who's following is now leading. So you switch roles. Switch roles. All right. Please thank your partner and take a seat. All right. Are you awake? Yes? Can we just have one or two very short reflections? Was it easier to lead or to follow? Quickly, whoever has a... Uh, who wants to speak? Very short reflection? Was it a hand? I will not put you on the spot unless you want to talk. It has... <laughs> I, was, I had something in my mouth. It was actually very easy to lead than to follow. What made it easy? Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Easier to lead than to follow. I'm not quite sure why. Interesting. Anyone else who found it easier to follow? I think for me it was both easy to lead and follow. Because I guess I kind of like understood that this time I'm supposed to follow and not lead. So I shouldn't control what it is that they're trying to do. Yeah, a natural networker. As long as there's clarity if you're leading or following. All right. I think, without, I think we probably have a lot of reflections on why in a network it's sometimes important to lead and to follow. And uh, let's see how we can do that in the coming year. But with this, I hand over to the next session. Are you ready, Julian? Perfect. Thank you all so much. Hello, good afternoon. How are we feeling right now? Yeah, so um, for the benefit of those who have not known my name. I'm Julian Natukunda. I'm with the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. And I'm delighted to be your chair this afternoon. So we have five speakers today, and three are here. We're waiting for one to join us, and one will be online. So this is the session called Networks and Partnerships. And I've been hearing people saying, break the silos. We need to network, we need to co collaborate. Also, in your interest, when you're registering for this conference, you said, we want to network. So we're bringing you uh, people here who, have, who are representing networks and some agencies in the region. And, okay. and these are going to take, talk to us about what they're doing in their networks. Now, if we have time, we shall take questions. But we are going to start with our first uh, speaker. And our first speaker is Miss Wada. Wada Kalotwe. I don't know if I'm doing it very well. And she's representing Miss Tracy Sony, who is um, from the Botswana Climate Change Network. 
Uh, Mitsuada is a graduate from the University of Pretoria with over 13 years of experience in development economics. She's working with the both government of Botswana and international organizations, and she's a board member of Botswana Climate Change Network responsible for programs, partnership, and communications. So, Ms. Weda, without uh, so much time, um, can you start your presentation? Are we ready? Yeah. So, Ms. Weda, you can start to have a mic. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as you've heard, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I represent uh, Botswana Climate Change Network. Next slide. I'm going to unpack our uh, Botswana Climate Change Network as uh, advocacy plan, as well as uh, uh, what we stand for. Oh, we are going to also explore opportunities uh, yeah. for our networking as well as partnership. And uh, we base our partnership as well as our networking on our BCCN structure, uh, which builds from 2016 to 2020 strategy. And it fulfills the 2021 to 2025 strategy, of which we uh, focus on uh, our secretariat, our core staff, as well as our thematic leads, and. Uh, youth uh, digital activist. Uh, we also focus on sub-district offices, uh, community resources persons. Uh, these are the people that we work with uh, so that we can fulfill our strategy. Next slide, please. <coughs> uh, we focus more on communication and advocacy. And our overall plan uh, objective is to have at least 70 people or stakeholders uh, to understand an overall climate change agenda as well as other instruments of uh, climate change. And uh, our goals are to impact knowledge, uh, change attitudes of people around us, as well as uh, the community at large. Uh, we want to build resilience, especially among women. We want to bridge that gap. Uh, we also leverage uh, on funding. And the audience that we target uh, for this advocacy plan uh, include the government leaders, uh, sectors, and uh, politicians. And uh, we do this so that we can ensure that policies, legislation, as well as regulations of uh, COP2021, 20, 20, as well as uh, SDGs are conducive. Uh, we also build our audiences uh, through businesses. Uh, we want them to appreciate on how climate change mitigation and plans uh, that of COP2021 21, uh, impacting their commercial uh, operations as well as right now and in the future. Uh, we also focus on sectors, uh, mostly on energy sector, agricultural sector, and transport sector uh, to make sure that uh, the plans that are of COP21 and SDG are very compliant. Uh, we also focus on investors. Uh, we want the private sector as well as our financial institutions uh, that will be prepared to invest in climate change mitigation as well as our measures. And uh, I'm sure we've all heard about green bonds. Uh, we further look into the consumers. Uh, we want the, our audiences, uh, uh, which are consumers, and mostly civil society, uh, to also be engaged. And uh, this includes property developers. I uh, want them to appreciate how climate change uh, should be part of their purchasing strategy. Uh, furthermore, we also want a development corporate cooperation uh, through communities. And uh, of this uh, includes uh, officials of international institutions, um, as well as uh, diplomats, uh, climate uh, civil society organization. Uh, we want them to be part of this audience uh, uh, because uh, most of them are our funders and our finances. So we want them to be uh, also ahead and uh, in tune with us. Uh. Uh, we're also looking at influencers and opinion mm -hmm. makers. Uh, these are the people Excellent. that include journalists, printed media, TVs, or radios, and social networks, as well as the academia. This include okay. universities. Okay. Uh, we also have the general okay. public. And uh, on the general issues and the role they play in mitigating climate change, Four. as well as mm -hmm. our building mm -hmm. resilience. Next slide, please. Uh, we continue to intensify our work on advocacy and uh, capacity building. 
And uh, by this, we engage our theory of change. And uh, with this theory of change, we want to, to collaborate. And uh, we co collaborate so that we can scale up our climate change impact. And uh, we want to do this by being inclusive with our ecosystem or stakeholders, uh, as well as our democracy towards pursuing the networks, organizational goals, as well as uh, uh, to be best positioned for us to have uh, that impact in the climate change arena. Next slide, please. Uh, we have um, our five A's, uh, which we use to uh, make sure that our climate advocacy is more audible. And uh, through this, we use uh, awareness. Uh, we make sure that we educate the public and the nation at large about uh, climate change issues. Uh, we also have uh, advocacy. Uh, we make sure that uh, there is so much uh, we do uh, in terms of uh, speaking about what is happening uh, in the climate uh, change arena, especially in our society uh, where there are some activities that are happening around our country, which uh, includes uh, the oiling uh, industry. Uh, we also uh, focus on activities uh, that uh, enable the network uh, to drive climate change uh, works that are um, around our communities. And uh, we do this through community programs as well as our projects. Uh, we also uh, engage on activism, uh, which implies that our society uh, is engaged uh, when it comes to uh, climate uh, change uh, network. Uh, we also engage the administration as well as accounting because we want transparency uh, with our organization. Next slide, please. Uh, we have principles uh, that uh, guide our, 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 our organization, and this includes uh, member-driven programs as well as a community co-creation, and uh, we also emphasize on knowledge-based programming. Next slide, please. What we are doing on the ground. Uh, we make sure that we equip the communities with skills, knowledge, and tools uh, to make sure that we engage in climate and health policy development, as well as uh, to strengthen their voice uh, at the domestic, continental, as well as our global levels. Uh, we also want to ensure that there is engagement and more coordinated uh, through the strengthening of coalitions as well as our network. Uh, we also engage in crucial uh, to facilitate and push for climate and health initiatives uh, so that we can respond to action that is sustainable and uh, people-oriented. Uh, we also have that we work on non-state non actors' uh, participation uh, because they have potential to ensure a buy-in of policies as well as guarantee uh, that response action, uh, which is designed uh, through understanding of local context, through social norms, as well as values and customs. Uh, on the ground, we also make sure that we are building critical mass of the non-state actors uh, that will interrogate policies and strategies against the set of minimum criteria uh, to ensure that our initiatives prioritize decentralized response action uh, that meets the needs of the people. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Wada. We have heard how they're working with the community. I think it's crucial to have community involvement and target those ones. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Dunya, and we heard from him yesterday. Dr. Dunya is a senior researcher with the um, Ethiopian Public Health Institute, and he's looking to, towards the epidemiology of malaria, particularly its relationship with climate viability and change in geographical areas. So he has expanded his skills in designing malaria surveillance tools and he's integrating climate information um, in, that, uh, in the tools. So Dr. Adunia, I will welcome you to talk to us about um, your presentation today and the network. Thank you very much. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, moderator for the introduction. So my presentation will uh, briefly focus on the areas you tried to introduce me. Please, next slide. 
<coughs> so as you can see, this uh, uh, logo is uh, related to my institute where I have worked for uh, more than a decade. Next slide. So this public health institute uh, enabled me to uh, understand some aspects of climate uh, combined with uh, the expertise I have as undergraduate in, and uh, graduate. So you can see this in this slide how the globe is warming and uh, you can see the nexuses of all the impacts that climate change have. And you can see the table in which we can see the impacts of climate change on vector borne diseases. We can, we can tell a number of them. Next slide. So, maybe one of the role of uh, my institute is that, as you can see, disease and health even surveillance and response is uh, one of the areas. And this is uh, done in collaboration with Ministry of Health. And you can see, uh, at sitting and presenting is a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so, you can see this letter. There is an invitation letter to, to me and my colleagues. Uh, we are representing uh, uh, the health sector as a steering committee for uh, climate and health issues. So you can see below that a graph in which uh, we have, uh, this is the surveillance system. This is one of the tools we have developed for malaria surveillance. And uh, uh, malaria surveillance which is one of the things we have contributed for malaria elimination. Next slide. So. After we developed that surveillance youth, one of the things uh, we took as an exercise is to prepare a policy brief in which uh, the 2015-2016 Illino was a, a challenge for the health system, and we tried to contribute to inform the Ministry of Health how the Illino is going to affect the malaria uh, distribution. So the advice we gave is, as you can see here, uh, we recommended some two bullets uh, for preparedness plan. Next slide. Yeah, so maybe one of the things uh, I, can, I can mention, temperature and heat is one of the challenges, and we can see how, uh, how the, the first, uh, uh, the cold and the heat stress, all those stress are uh, having something to do with human uh, physiology. Uh, so we are expected to generate uh, evidence, like we have to collaborate in research, and we have to engage uh, institutions and uh, individuals from various disciplines. So this has to be done in a coordinated manner, and uh, <clears throat> we need also co-sponsors for the research. And the other thing is we have to also train, and we have to think about the succession plan for research, because this is something that we cannot interrupt. This is not going to be limited to a certain group of people who are able to do this time. They have to have young uh, researchers who could, uh, throughout time, could replace them. So we have to show the full spectrum of uh, the, health, the health impacts of climate change, and we have to frame the way the policymakers could take into account and uh, make decisions or resources. The next slide. Yeah, uh, as already been informed by the people, uh, colleagues from uh, WHO Afro, this is uh, one of the, the, this big circle shows how this uh, 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 climate uh, resilient health system is very important. And uh, the Ministry of Health is expected to enhance creating climate resilient health system. And uh, there has to be a quality controlled health data that means for us to do modeling and the time series analysis uh, in which people could believe us more if you do more robust analysis. And the other thing is we have to engage local leaders, community-based organizations, public health and the healthcare workers. Uh, as, as it has been mentioned many times, health professionals are more trusted in the community and we have to all, also focus on the civil society at grassroots level, which are closely working with the community. Next. Yeah, so the actions required uh, try to be, uh, we have to create uh, awareness, capacity building, and create a strong platform and a committed professional mix. Uh, these are the things I was trying to mention. We have to take the gender issue into account, the experts uh, we have into account, and all those things are 
what are expected from the public health institute uh, as they are uh, doing a cross-cutting thing. So they are not focusing on a certain or individual level. They focus on a community level. I think this is the last slide. Maybe let's see. Next. Yeah, that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Erlinger. So yesterday we heard we didn't have enough surveillance systems, and now we can see your work, how it fits in um, how we can better predict and prevent diseases. As well, you are talking about moving beyond research and having a succession plan. It's not about just publishing, but also translating the messages. So I think that is the key point that I see, and I think that is good work. So um, let's welcome our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ms. Melvin Otieno. She's an environmental health scientist and founder of the Planetary Health East, African, East Africa Hub. And she's an activist in Kenya who is working closely with the German Alliance Climate Change. And they're doing an online course on climate change and health, planetary health leadership. So um, she has a BSc in environmental biology and health and a master's in environmental health, and she's serving as a Next Generation Network Fellow uh, right now. Uh, she's also an associate member, team member of Women's Leaders for Planetary Health right now. So, Ms. Melvin, please, you're welcome to talk to us about this uh, network. Thank you so much for having me today. I'll speak about uh, the Planetary Health East African Hub. This is a movement that started off back in 2019 when I was a campus ambassador, um, focusing on uh, planetary health activities in Kenya. Then basically we ended up uh, networking with other people within the region and we started this movement under the Planetary Health Alliance that is based at Harvard. And it's a consortium of around 360 universities and also has a non NGOs also and research institutes and uh, also government entities from around the world committed to understand and address global uh, environmental change and its health. Uh, next slide, please. So the Planetary Health East and African Hub basically aims at stimulating regional community building, as well as provide education for transformative action and also push for policy making in our emergency time. So we see that uh, we, our vision is also to have a region that uh, a region that everyone uh, prospers in engaging and empower, empowering uh, to address climate change and planetary health issues uh, in order to safeguard human health and also restoring the Earth's ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we see that uh, some of the activities that we do as a hub is that, next slide, please. Uh, some of the activities we do as a hub is that we've been hosting uh, workshops, lecture series, and inviting international and regional experts to share about the planetary health projects. And then we've also been trying as much as possible to raise public awareness of planetary health challenges. And at the moment, we have been working on uh, developing educational curriculum and learning resources. By this, we are trying to come up with a planetary health toolbox that will help universities across Africa to embed planetary health and climate change as a unit or, or as an elective course in their institutions. At the same time, we have been trying to collaborate with research. Uh, we have been collaborating with researchers from different parts of the world. And also, we are trying to work hand in hand with the communities who are affected by uh, uh, climate change, especially the indigenous community. Uh, last, uh, last year, but one, we did a very fantastic project on engaging the community, especially in how do we communicate the issue of climate change and health. And besides that, uh, across the globe, so it has increased strategically from 2019. We, only, we had that one campus ambassador, and now we, ha we have around 122 campus ambassadors as in, as in worldwide. And we have seen a number of these uh, youth leaders increasing in Africa as well. Aside from that, uh, Next slide, please. We have uh, our members from diverse, uh, from, from diverse uh, perspectives. We have people from uh, the student networks, the academia, research institutions, local NGOs, and organizations that are partnering with us. And then we've been trying as much as possible also to leverage the global network. Next slide, please. So by this, we've been partnering with the uh, organizations from Europe, USA, 
UK and so on uh, in, this, uh, in our activities. And through that, we've seen the growth uh, of how this movement has been uh, created. And uh, for those who really don't know what planetary health is, it's a so solution-oriented transdisciplinary concept and also a social movement focused on analyzing and addressing the impacts of human disruptions uh, to the Earth's natural uh, systems on human health and environment. So by this, the overarching goal is to achieve health for all populations. Next slide, please. To achieve the health for all populations uh, while living um, balance with our environment. So you find out that uh, as a result of this, we've seen that uh, Africa really needs to prioritize uh, planetary health since there are a number of uh, planetary health uh, concerns, the issues of climate change, mental health, zoonotic diseases that we have, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the, okay. And, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the region really needs to prioritize planetary health concept and also synergize uh, one health concept because we see that the most affected uh, people are from Africa who are affected disproportionately with the issues of climate change and so on. So by this, um, as a result of the Eastern African hub, we are also, we saw that there is uh, a gap in knowledge. So we wanted to engage more of the academias into planetary health education. Next slide, please. By this, how does the planetary health education in, in practice looks like? So we've been doing uh, consultative meetings with the universities in East Africa, and some of the universities already have embedded planetary health as planetary health and climate change as an elective course or also as a, as a unit. And also we've been trying as much as possible to partner with the medical practitioners. We did an amazing uh, event or webinar series with the uh, organization called Dactari Online, who are a group of medical practitioners. And at the same time, through our ongoing project, next slide, please. Uh, through our ongoing project, uh, the SOFIA project, Strengthening One Health and Planetary Health in East Africa, that we are currently focusing on, uh, we are trying to come up with a toolbox that will help different universities to uh, use our, the learning resources to, to review their curriculum for planetary health and one health. So um, in conclusion, I would like to say, next slide, please. In conclusion, I would like to say that the Planetary Health Eastern Africa Hub has increased its visibility and has shown positive impact since 2019. And as a result of that, uh, we've been having uh, ongoing collaborations with the German Alliance for Climate Change and other global institutions. Therefore, a bilateral north to south learning partnerships uh, could be established, and also support of national and uh, trans-regional uh, and international cooperation could be fostered, especially when we want to synergize both One Health and Planetary Health uh, concepts. And then also more youths um, uh, have been championing planetary health, and we have a number of campus ambassadors. And besides uh, having an active Eastern Africa hub, we see other new hubs forming up, like we already have uh, the launch of Western Africa hub, which is really positive and therefore integrating planetary health and climate change into uh, the educational curriculum is also being fostered. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm looking forward to discussing further. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Melvin. Uh, you're targeting the youth, you're working on learning materials, you're local, you're going regional. I think you're doing great work because some of the courses that people are still learning are not yet updated with climate change, recent data, and how to prepare you know, the upcoming generations to take up this mantle. So I think that is a great start, and we can look forward to probably seeing your online resources yeah. and also hearing about your regional um, networks because we haven't really known where you are in your phone fluid. So hopefully we get time for that. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to give a little bit of break from these uh, physical or in-person <laughs> presentations. Uh, you have to be the last one. So right now let's switch to Dr. Nevo. Dr. Nevo Sweet is the director um, for an Alliance for Climate and Health Systems Science, it's ACCESS, called ACCESS in short, at the University of Cape Town. 
and he's worked in various roles with the job of building and implementing science and training programs in South Africa and the sub-region, and his current research focuses on trends in seasonal climate characteristics with a special emphasis on health effects of climate change. He's been and he's the lead investigator in several international research projects on this topic. So let's give it up to Dr. Neville to give us his talk on access. <laughs> Dr. Neville, can you hear us? I can hear you. Perfect. Can you uh, hear me? We can hear you well. Um, you Good. need to share your screen. I have shared my screen. I'm not sure whether you can see it or it's projected properly. Not yet. Give us a... Yeah. Ah, now we can there see you. Go. Okay, you great. Go. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm not from the University of Cape Town. <laughs> I work... Uh, I'm employed by the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. But ACCESS is a program which encompasses uh, several partners in South Africa, including the University of Cape Town. And I wanted to uh, use this opportunity to tell you about a new effort uh, that we are putting in place in South Africa. It's called REACH. It's the Research Alliance for Climate and Health. And I want to emphasize that it's a focus specifically on the research aspects of the relationship between climate and health. So it doesn't cover all aspects of the relationship, but in particular, a focus on the research, mainly because there are so many new um, uh, people and institutions and agencies and calls and efforts in research on this topic, we felt in South Africa we needed to get better organized. So that's what uh, we are doing. And um, I guess the key message that I want to, to uh, communicate is that climate change, the message that I, I like to tell in, in explaining why we're doing this is because Climate change is no longer in the future. It's no, it's, nothing, it's no longer something we have to worry about for the future. It is something which is already manifested. And it manifests in seasonal and in weather dynamics. So we need to think about climate change differently now. There's, there's a shift from if and when to how is it manifesting, from what it may be to what are the impacts. Um, and so why this is important is because it integrates time scales. We're, not no, we're no longer talking about years to decades. We're talking about seasons. We're talking about months to years. We're talking about weather from minutes to weeks uh, in, in the impact of climate uh, in an integrated way. And extreme events and weather events are really a very important currency uh, uh, expressed seasonally and in weather. Um, this is how people really experience climate and climate change. Not on average, but in the short term. So this thinking stems from a framework called the Global Framework for Climate Services from the WMO, um, uh, which so several member states are developing into national frameworks for climate services. And very important, it is to connect up all aspects of climate work to various sectors, including health as one of them. And it's a two-way street. It's important that health practitioners are able to specify their needs of the climate scientists. And it's important for the climate scientists to be able to communicate their capability to the researchers. And this relationship needs to be built. And that's what we're trying to do with REACH. On the right-hand side, there is a, a, a sort of a, a schematic of of the services we need to deliver at an operational scale in the short term when things are happening right now, like an extreme event or a disease outbreak or a flood or a storm or something like that, uh, through the tactical to know what the next season, we've heard talk about the El Nino this year, for example, what to expect in the next weeks or months, to decades. And these are all now integrated into one time, into one time scope. And so what we really want to work towards is an integrated, targeted, user-focused, seamless, end-to-end -end operational early warning system for various sectors, including health. And that's what we want to do with REACH. So REACH uh, comprises three anchor tenants. Those are the South African Medical Research Council, the South African Weather Service, and the Department of Health in South Africa, 
in the form of the National Institute for Communicable Diseases and the National Department of Health. And why those three organizations? Because they have the mandate to do this. But this is not an exclusive club. It's completely open. All uh, people are, who are interested in climate uh, health and, and health research are, are hopefully going to join this network. And we are setting up that network now. I'll explain to you in a moment what we're going to do. Um, and uh, very importantly is to include not just medical practitioners, but medical businesses, such as the private sector in pharmacy and in uh, medical insurance and private medical health care, uh, to try and create a community that are talking to each other about how they can help each other in the research required for, for this effort. Um, so really what we want to do is grow the membership, as I've just described, assist with the development of national uh, research strategies around climate and health, collate and disseminate information on all existing research, who's doing what and where, I'll develop that in a moment, disseminate where appropriate what funding is available, raise funding potentially for our partners, uh, develop channels of communication of research outputs, uh, this is publications and so on, as we've heard other groups that are doing as well. Organize responses to emerging climate and health challenges. Um, organize regular scientific events um, and opportunities to interact within this, this network. And then potentially represent the health uh, and climate research community in official processes, such as uh, the ones I've, I've mentioned above. So there are a couple of activities we immediately are involved in. I mentioned this this morning, we want to develop a typology, and, and there's a reason for this. A typology means to, to, to kind of define all the language that we use in climate and health as a growing field. It's important to define what we mean by climate variability, climate change, infectious diseases, responses, or, or other um, uh, terminology that may not be familiar with everybody. We need to do that, and we want to do that because we want to do a survey to see who's doing what research across the scope of this framework uh, and identify both what, what is being done and what is not being done for the, for the purposes of developing a real a sort of a position paper, a position on what is the real priority research in South Africa to start with, potentially beyond that. Um, and I wanted to just elaborate this on this in, in a moment. Uh, just to mention that um, we, we have got two research alliances. So this, this slide, what it does is it tries to categorize where you might find yourself on a climate and health research continuum. So on the left-hand side, we might have a set of classifications, this is really draft zero, of what kind of climate work you do or you need to know about. So you might be interested in climate observations or weather prediction or climate projections over the longer term time scales, or you might be interested in modeling or extreme events, et cetera, et cetera. And on the medical side, you might be interested in areas such as the impact of those climate uh, parameters on neurology or on cancers or on respiratory illnesses, or on cholera or on bacterial diseases. And so we want people in our survey to identify where it is that they fall out so we can assess who is doing what. So we're busy developing this framework. We will publish this framework and then use that to scope out what it is we need to be doing uh, and what it is that people are doing. Uh, that is the way we'll develop the strategy. Um, and then I wanted to propose something which, which I spoke about this morning, something for chance and potentially for us in the region or whoever might be interested. And this is building on the previous concept, and that is the idea of developing a classification of uh, disease and illness or, um, or, or impact of climate on health. So, for example, you might take malaria, you might want to categorize uh, what kind of disease it is, what its etiology is, where it's distributed, um, what the climate determinants are that, that drive malaria, what are the risks of those trends in those climate determinants, uh, what research and who is doing what, what are adaptation options. Or you might want to do that for something which is uh, has a direct impact, like drowning, for example, and, or floods, 
and what are the impacts. So the idea here is to develop a classification of diseases for climate and health. Okay, so I think uh, that's pretty much everything I wanted to tell you. Um, I, I just to summarize that, that we've started this research alliance. The real focus is on research and to try and scope out the research and identify who's doing what and what is not being attended to and should be attended to in the form of a research strategy. We're having this meeting in, uh, in November. Very happy to have people participate and uh, join this alliance, which is at the moment only South African, but we're gonna grow it should that be necessary and, and, and feasible. And, uh, and then finally to say, I'm proposing this idea of, of, of developing a classification system like an ICD code for, uh, for climate and health. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nevo, thank you so much. We heard from you in the morning and it's good to re-echo what we heard from you in the morning. What I hear from your message is climate change is here, so maybe we should stop saying climate change will affect health and start saying climate change is affecting health. And what are we doing about it? And what are we lacking? But the key message I also hear is, have we identified ourselves along the climate health continuum? Do we know where we lie? And maybe then we can better network well and know who is doing what. Imagine if everyone knew what everyone is doing. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's learning from each other. And that's why we're bringing a few examples of what people are doing. We need to start the same. Don't reinvent the wheel. This is where we can learn from. And this came out in the morning. So let's go on to the last speaker. Dr. Evans Kitui is our principal consultant of Dell Agro and Nairobi based consultancy. He brings over 20 years of experience in international development research and practice to the firm. He specializes in offering advisory services in the fields of sustainable energy, climate change, and the green economy with a focus on Anglophone Africa. Evans holds a PhD in environmental science and an MBA in strategic management. So Evans, you're here. We are supposed to have Martin Machange uh, for this session, but Evans is here to deliver also a message uh, where Martin was uh, last evening. So Evans, let's take away. Thank you. Um, so is it working? Okay, good. So um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here today. I came in late yesterday because I had to leave uh, the long way. Uh, just when they were busy validating the common position that we had worked so hard to develop because I needed to be here and, and all these connections and so on required that I leave earlier. So let's have the next slide, please. Um, like we had in the morning, um, particularly from uh, our colleague on BC from UNEP and uh, even uh, 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 Brahma from uh, WHO, there really isn't anything new around this subject. There have been discussions over time, over the past several years, around climate change and health. But it has ended in those corners where people talk about it, okay? Whether it was in academia or in research or whatever. What has lacked uh, and what uh, many stakeholders now believe need a push is the advocacy element to place climate change and health on the table, on the negotiating table. And they believe um, that the best thing we can ever achieve now is to target a work program. And they recognize that getting that work program through the UNFCCC is not an easy task, but there is need to get started. So that's how these three organizations, PACJA, AFIDEP, and AMREF Africa, came together and uh, reasoned with stakeholders in a number of forums during the year and decided that this is the time to get started. And so they hired our company to help them uh, in this process. So next step, please. Next slide. Yeah, so... Um, 
This slide actually illustrates uh, the process and the desired change as it, it went. So in the first section, the activities that we carried out, of course, before the conference, where we dug through uh, masses of uh, you know, literature and reports and decisions of the COP and AMSEN and so on to find where some of these decisions and declarations lie. Then, of course, uh, interrogating and developing a program for the event, the, the regional forum. And then in the meeting itself, which ended yesterday, um, this was a facilitated forum where we had a number of ministers of environment and health of a number of countries. We had African group of negotiators. A few members were there um, representing the, the AGN and also just to provide guidance on what are the steps, where are the potential entry points, what can we expect, where are we being too ambitious, and so on. So these are the kind of things that we had there. We also had members from academia, civil society, and all these other organizations represented in Lilongwe to uh, interrogate this particular uh, uh, position. So um, the common position was really the end of our game where we led the, the process within our sphere of control. We had the document ready and yesterday morning they spent time just validating it and then we had the AGN, WHO and other colleagues uh, from uh, governments uh, you know, giving their final uh, 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 endorsements of that and we have a copy of that ready. Now, the next is, you know, carrying this common position. So what? We have a number of avenues which have been identified which are going to follow. And this comes on the heels of the upcoming um, Africa Climate Summit happening in Nairobi um, in the next few weeks, uh, is it days? Um, so there's going to be a number of avenues to follow. Um, so many have been proposed, but uh, we have recommended the following as the lower hanging fruits. There's targeting a ministerial dinner happening in Nairobi where ministers of health have been invited and which our colleague Hendricks from Malawi already indicated the, the Malawi minister will be um, gracing the rest of her colleagues uh, to interrogate that statement further, okay, just to sell it to them and say, this is really where we need to go. And when ministers have a grasp of what uh, stakeholders are thinking and recommending for them, um, then even if it doesn't go further towards the COP, at least they have the ideas which they can integrate within their own government documentation. We have the NAPs, the NDCs, and so on that can benefit from this process. Then we have the AGN. Luckily, like I said, we had the AGN members on the ground to kind of give us an idea of what they would expect from this kind of a statement. So after this, we will be massaging that statement to suit that context and then be able to uh, have them work with it. Um, and then definitely there'll be several pathways. Uh, to which they can uh, deliver that. And then, of course, there is a COP28 coming up. There are so many events around that, even before the COP itself. So those are some of the activities that this position, again, is being targeted by different actors and stakeholders who are behind this particular st uh, statement. And, of course, at the end of the day, the dream is to have something like a work program on health and climate change coming somewhere down the road, whenever that would be. Next step, please. So um, the structure of that common position is so simple. It has a preamble, of course, uh, some few niceties uh, that you know, bring us to appreciate that, and then the decision themselves. The, the decisions, we have recommendations for the UNFCCC. We have some for the AGN, uh, AU and the RECs national governments, and of course, developed countries. And finally, uh, if I can have the last slide, um, it's strongly recommended, and of course, the messages that go to the AGN 
are being packaged around the key negotiating themes uh, for the COP. We have the loss and damage. We have adaptation and the recommendations that target the GGA, which is going to be um, um, the key decisions are going to come out this year. Mitigation and just transition. All this relating to health and then finance. And something that came out very strongly, they need to emphasize the One Health focus. So if you are interested in having a look at the common position, send me an email and you'll have it right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, our very own speakers today. I think this session was brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Evans, for highlighting um, the process and the activities. I can't water down what you've just said because this is um, highly processed information by very many delegates. And I think if we want more information, uh, we're going to have to approach now these people in our own time. We'll try to put a document with links and contact details of everyone so we can actually strategize and ask the questions we have and all the collaborations and networking we want to do with them after this session. So please allow us to end this session here and say that now that you know the faces behind the organizations and agencies, please reach out to them and we'll be sharing more details with you. Thank you very much. And we are going to have a picture. I'll hand over to the next speaker for the session, Bettina. Yeah. While we wait for the photo, you can have a stretch if you want. If you're able to, you can stretch one arm up as high as you can and then drop it behind your back, if at all possible. And give yourselves a pat on the shoulder. We're nearly there. Well done. Good. Thank you for this panel. I think what a two days it has been. We really covered a lot of ground and we ended with a rich option of networks to further engage with, to link up with. I hope you have met at least one or two persons you haven't known before coming here. And can I just see who has met at least one or two persons that you haven't known before in the last two days? Have you met one or two new persons in the last two days? Or did you, did you keep to yourself more than two? All right, fantastic. This is a moment for reflection, and I hand over to Caroline to get us going. We're jointly moderating this session. Caroline, over to you. Um, yes, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. And who also learned something new they didn't know before? Who learned something new? No? You knew everything? <laughs> That's wonderful. So now I want you to take a minute or two to do the last um, interaction with your neighbors and tell one or two people. Before you do this, can we just have one minute of total silence where in your mind you walk back to when you arrived. Can you do that? You walk back to when you arrived and you more or less see what stands out for you between that moment when you arrived and the moment where we are in now. Just for yourself. And if you can not speak, that will be awesome. Just for a moment. See if something st stood out for you, some interesting insights, some surprises, something you've learned, something you were annoyed by, frustrated by. All right, and now, Caroline, I hand over to you. Yeah, have you reflected? <laughs> Now you can share with a neighbor or two. Um, yeah? Share with a neighbor or two. Sorry. I forgot the name of them. Um, what your key take-home messages and actions 
are. Yeah, and then we'll get to hear from maybe a, a couple of you. So let us continue to network. Yeah, so speak to one person or two and tell them what your key take home message has been. All right, thank you. Now, take a deep breath and share, share your thoughts at your table. Can you share your highlights with people at the table, your joint highlights from both groups? Or if you had one group, you can keep sharing or joining another table as you like. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you can hear me and someone is talking to you, can you smile at them and invite them to stop? Very good. Thank you. Let's take a deep breath. For those of you who can hear me, thank you. And yeah, there are lots of insights here that need to come out. I can hear it. Um, now, I would love it if you could stop talking for a little bit. We're nearly there, and we would like to close. So if you feel my hand on your shoulder, then it's an invitation to listen. Can I please ask you also to conclude your conversation? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, when I asked to be quiet here, I can hear it starting here. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. It's so great because you're not on Zoom. You can actually make eye contact. Eh? But you have a lot of privileges because you survived being stuck in a lift yesterday which is maybe your key insight. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Let's hear a, a quick feedback from some of the tables. We just take your top three. We just take three tables to say, what have you heard that maybe someone else's insight was that you thought was inspiring, amazing, new? Over here, short and sharp. 
guess is the frustration of um, of not mentioning transport logistics for the health sector when we talk about building resilient health systems and also uh, talking about climate and health. So I've been to different forums where these issues are being discussed and that's my biggest worry because we do transport logistics for the health sector and it cuts across. But how do you build resilient systems if you don't even mention the transport? Even emergency referral is transport. Even public health workers going to the communities is transport. How do we get it on the agenda so that it is also discussed as we talk about these health issues? Thank you. Coming up next on the agenda, transport and health. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your frustration with us. Any other insights? Thoughts you'd like to share? You, you, it's, it's not extremely easy to nominate someone else, but you can nominate yourself. Mm -hmm. yes. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is my take home from, from, from this uh, gathering. Um, my biggest take home, my personal take home, is that climate change and health has a voice. When I looked at this room, when I looked at the interactions and the impassioned engagement, it said to me, climate health, um, climate change and health has a voice. It has a capable voice. It is an impassioned voice and a voice that can be heard. And then my only plea is that let this voice not be heard at the next chance. Let there be continuous dialogue from here. Let there be continuous engagement. Like Professor Moy said, let those silos, even amongst us uh, professionals and uh, technical people, we are the ones to break those silos from here so that our voice gets amplified and amplified. But my take home is that there is a voice. Everybody's been saying climate, health and, uh, climate change and health. So as Chance being part of a collaboration and engagement community, and it's only the second year, so we understand why things are a bit fragmented. But I guess going forward, we'll be collaborating more. Thank you so much, indeed. Last but not least, over to you. Yeah, what I've learned is the opportunities for benchmarking for the, for the best practices from other countries. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. We, yes, online. Fantastic. Hello, may I speak? Oh, fantastic. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I would like to congratulate uh, the conference on really doing an amazing job. I've learned a lot, especially seeing all the different things people are doing. I, I would like to um, also emphasize what a colleague wrote in the chat, that we actually need to have some kind of repository for all of this information, because there's a danger that we're working in uh, silos or we're not cross-fertilizing enough. And the other thing I would like to say is that um, we have to find ways of communicating all this information to the wider public using the media, uh, whatever fora we have, because um, I think there's lots of very skilled work going on, but there still isn't the awareness of the urgency of this in many communities. So we have to find ways of letting people know and advertising, promoting what we're doing um, so that people can see that there are things that they can do because the more successful uh, people are, then the more engaged they will be. And, um, you know, uh, finding popular ways of getting the messages across. I gave the example that, you know, if we put solar panels on the roof of a clinic, um, why not have a sign there just saying we have solar panel panels yeah. on our clinic as our contribution towards uh, uh, reducing climate change or if we if we have i think there's a fast food joint which has a sign on its till that says please please ask if you want plastic cutlery so they're not including it automatically you have to ask for it just simple things like that to reduce uh, single use plastic there are lots of ideas but we just need to get them out there 
Thank Thanks you. very much. Thanks for including us from the online group. Thank you so much. And also to the online participants, a special thank you for bearing with us. You, you, sometimes it's very hard to synchronize our, our lunch being a bit late and then we are not starting on time. But thank you for being flexible and uh, having a degree of patience with us. Um, Caroline, anything to add? No? Then I think this concludes the, this session, but not the conference, because for this I'll hand over to Vincent to take us through the final session. It's a closing session to give us an idea. Maybe be, while Winston comes here, can I just make two quick announcements? The one is, please, if you still have your 50 Pula voucher, donate it to someone who can club up and buy a more expensive item that they desire, but please show solidarity or spend the 50 Pula yourself or even better, Buy an expensive item, use your 50 Pula voucher and pay the rest in cash. Um, we need to support the local businesses here, so please uh, show solidarity. That would be much appreciated. And Sorry? The magnets are 50 Pula and the very cool key rings are also 50 Pula. Then we also share the presentations. I'm not sure, Vincent, if you're going to say this. And a, a survey will come your way to gather your reflections and your insights in more depth. We'd love it if you can share your feedback, good and critical feedback, so we can improve for next time. We have noted the transport issue and uh, other issues being raised, but I think it would be really, really useful to get your feedback um, in more detail coming your way in the next days. With this, I hand over to Vincent. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you. But before I close, I will invite... <laughs> because you're supposed to take us through the future plans of the Enbel project for five minutes. Can you, can you do it before I close? Uh, yes, actually, maybe even quicker because uh, everybody's a bit tired. Uh, but uh, what we discussed in our group, and I think the main ideas was already spoken between a few, uh, maybe it's the first question also for you. Uh, if you had this discussion in Paris, who of you learned something new that he didn't notice during the meeting? Uh, like uh, you gave information to the other person and uh, was this information for you in some sense? Uh, that, uh, okay, that's co too complicated, but then uh, explain maybe in more detail, like you were in a conference and you listened to the presentations, but uh, usually you don't pick up all the details. But now when you had uh, information also for another person, did you get also something new? Yeah, the, sometimes uh, we have to listen things a couple of times and pick up the things. So it takes time to kind of take these messages and uh, and it's the same for the policy makers and the decision makers. So you have to talk different messages a lot of different times, and then they start understanding. So it's not a quick process. But what has been uh, most inspiring me is uh, this crowd here. So, so many very well knowledge people, and you do much more than actually you think uh, you think uh, in Europe and in other countries they do a lot on climate change and health, and, but it's not uh, true though. In Europe the community is also quite the same size. Sorry, sorry also knows and some others though. It's not that uh, thousands of people are working with climate change and health, it's, it's also quite small. But, uh, but even uh, it's hundred people who can do a lot. So. Uh, uh, and, and what we also discussed uh, in our table was uh, that 
not uh, uh, already a lot has been done in Africa, so it's not uh, starting. Actually, you maybe just don't know what the others are doing. So and and this information and uh, for instance, if you say like in Europe they are doing something, okay, in Europe. But if you say, like, in Namibia they are doing something, why we are not doing that in our country? In Tanzania we are doing, uh, they are doing something. So then uh, the local policy makers thought, why are we worse than our neighbors? So uh, the examples don't be, must, uh, shouldn't be very far. If we have examples uh, that is more closer, the easier, then, uh, then it's, it is uh, even uh, better. So it has been uh, great uh, to be here and, and you are doing really great. So thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Hans. And thank you, Bettina, for the <laughs> for the great work uh, of, um, you know, making us active. She's very good in making us active, especially in the afternoon, after lunch. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is a, I don't know, a difficult moment. But before I say anything in closure, I just want us to appreciate uh, among us one of the special delegates she didn't come uh, uh, during the opening session, but she decided to be here with us the whole day. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Adelaide Onyango, who is the director, Universal Health Coverage, Healthier Population Cluster of the WHO Regional Office for Africa. Uh, she's from Congo Brazzaville in our head office. Uh, you can just stand up, uh, talk so that they see you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I did see you. <laughs> All right, but we thank you so much for supporting us and for being here with us the whole day. It's really important and it is encouraging a lot to see uh, people at your level come in to be with us all this time. You can give a hand clap again. All right, uh, we have just come to the end of our robust, I would say, informative, uh, engaging conference. I want to believe that um, majority of you can share the, the same sentiments with me that we could be continuing with a day or two because we believe that some of the sessions or some of the topics were not thoroughly interrogated. Um, you know, there was really kind of a very squashed program, but very rich. Um, but because of time and resources, we could not do it more than that. Uh, with um, topics that were discussed, I want to believe that we have reached our conference objectives. Uh, the topics were touching more on the status quo, addressing the real urgent issues uh, on climate change and health research and policy development in Africa, uh, in discussing the key research findings on climate and health in Africa, we listened to some empirical evidence and case studies which were reflecting on the impact of heat on health, as well as how climate sensitive infectious diseases are becoming a burden, and if no effective control and response measures which are put in place, the burden of this disease will worsen. We also had a number of sessions which facilitated an exchange of best practices on climate change and health policies and the climate response, and of which this morning we had a panel discussion by decision makers from various African countries deliberating on Africa's progress in adaptation in the health sector. The session was complemented by the commitments by the WHO Afro Regional Office, which are aimed at supporting adaptation initiatives, 
such as the COP26 commitments through the Attach program. I want to believe that through this chance network conference, we will influence Botswana in signing the initiative. So I'm with you, Prof. Pramakone, on that one, because Botswana is selected as one of the um, pilot centers for that, uh, for that program. It's very crucial. We deliberated on how uh, we can facilitate access to climate financing, and that included reflecting on the status quo and identifying opportunities and challenges through group, group discussions on climate financing, on health systems, and climate change and health research funding. We had the Welcome Trust explaining the process of applying uh, for climate change and health funds, and I believe with conclusions from this conference, we could also advocate for an improved access to such funds. Above all, uh, we had an opportunity to establish a further network between Chance Network members and organizations uh, who were part of this great conference proceedings. And I believe these networks will yield a long-lasting collaborations as a way of supporting climate health adaptation in Africa. I want to promise you that an analysis of high-level outcomes from this conference will be conducted, and these will be shared with, or, and even published, so it is accessible to the climate health community. Most importantly, um, it is my desire that all these outcomes may form part of the health voice at COP28 in Dubai. Uh, I like what Rico said yesterday and also what Malvin said uh, 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 right now during the reflections when they cited to say health has a voice and must be heard. And, I, and, uh, and we need to be, uh, since we said we are the face of climate change, we need to be a face with a voice. And also, it's my wish that uh, the outcomes or the messages, key messages that came from this conference may also be incorporated to form <coughs> part of the common position paper that was uh, discussed by Evans. We can contribute to that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the Chance Network Steering Committee, I thank you a million times uh, for certain time to travel all the way and all over the world to be with us, to make this conference a success. You can clap hands for yourself. I also want to thank the Chance Network Steering Committee for tirelessly putting this work together. It is not an easy thing to organize a conference, trust me. But the team was determined uh, through one spirit to make this a success. I also want to thank you, NBEL partners, CISRO, Vets University, Aga Khan University in Kenya, the Red Cross, uh, for supporting, even financially, to complement our Botswana budget, even to sponsor some of the delegates who traveled all over the world. My local team, Prof. Britt Nakstad, Ms. Anikima Thoma, Ms. Katya Holifatsi, Mutlokomed Moranuke, you are stars. This could have not been possible without you, uh, especially Katleho and Mutlokomedi, who were on the ground. Your dedication, organization skills were amazing. They made everything possible the way you see it. You can clap hands for, for them. And I wish you can see them actually. Yeah, that would be very important. Can you call Katleho and Mutlokomedi? And last, uh, let me also thank the Chazen Media Company. Uh, this is an amazing group. I couldn't uh, you know, stop to think about the work they're doing. These guys were self-driven. They were so much dedicated to assist us. Anytime, any odd hours, even midnight or early mornings, they'll be there for us. And on Wednesday, they had to set up, and they never slept until the, 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 the opening ceremony. So it was really touching to see such a company supporting also uh, beyond working hours. We thank you so much, uh, Chef and Media. Yeah. And they did a great job. Yeah. Also, thanks everyone. <laughs> yeah, these are the vibrant ladies 
Wife are smiling. They never show they are tired. They helped us a lot. And uh, they did this work. These two ladies, two. <laughs> yeah, this is Motoko Meji Murano Kedis Katla Holifatsi. She's my assistant in Maung. She flew all the way to come and make this conference possible to help Katla Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to thank you once again, everyone, for participating in this conference for these two days. Your presence really made a difference. Can we just put a tap on our shoulders? We did it. We did it. Say to yourself, we did it. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I think uh, this is the end of my closing message. I will wait to receive any announcements or anything important for our delegates to know from here. Unfortunately, we don't have a planned dinner like last night. Yeah, so it's time for you to go and explore gaps. Um, okay, she was just reminding me that the conference report will be shared with everyone. Uh, yes, immediately, as, as soon as it's ready. So it will be shared by email to everyone. All right, so those who are interested, uh, you can see Katle Hwani Mutokomit there and register your name. It's later on after seven, you want to, to go explore, go deep into the town. <laughs> we, are, we are happy to assure you. Um, without anything else, without any report or announcement, I think we can just now chat, exchange numbers, talk more. Uh, and uh, go rest, take a bit of a rest, have our dinner, and prepare ourselves. Yes, thank you so much.